Stone of Tears by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 455. He held her horse for her as she slid off. With a groan, she rubbed the flats of her hands on her bottom. If you make me ride that beast again tomorrow, I will bite you. For the first time since they had left the Magendi, he was able to smile. As Richard went about unsaddling the horses, he sent Du Shailu to get water in a canvas bucket. While she went off through the reeds and rushes to the pond, Sister Verna gathered wood and used her magic to set it afire. When he was finished caring for the horses, he put them on long tethers so they could graze on the grass. I guess introductions are in order, Richard said when Du Shailu returned. Sister Verna, this is Du Shailu. Du Shailu, this is Sister Verna. Sister Verna seemed to have cooled, or at least put a mask over her anger. I am pleased for you, Du Shailu, that you did not have to die this day. Du Shailu glared. Richard knew she thought of the Sisters of the Light as witches. I do feel sorrow, however, the sister added, for all those who will die in your place. You are not pleased for me. You wish me dead. You wish all the Bakaban Mana to die. That is not true. I wish no one to die. But I know I could not convince you of that. Think what you will. Du Shailu took the sacrificial knife from her belt and held the handle in front of Sister Verna's eyes. They kept me on that chain for three moons. She looked to the green handle and pointed to one of the obscene couplings carved on it. Those dogs did this to me. Sister Verna glanced to the knife as Du Shailu tapped a finger to another scene. And this... And this, too. Sister Verna watched the other's chest heaving in ire. There is no way I could convince you, Du Shailu, how much I abhor what they did to you and what they intended to do. There are many things in this world that I abhor but can do nothing about and in some cases must tolerate in order to serve a greater good. Du Shailu patted her belly. I have lost my moon flow. Those dogs have put me with child. Now I must go to the midwives and ask them for herbs to shed the child of a dog. Sister Verna clasped her hand before herself. Please, Du Shailu, don't do that. A child is a gift from the Creator. Please don't reject his gift. Gift? This great Creator has a wicked way of bestowing his gifts. Du Shailu, Richard said. Up until now, the Majendi have killed every Bakaban Mana they have captured. You are the first to be freed. They will kill no more. Think of this child as symbol of the new life between your peoples. For that new life, for all your children to flourish, the killing must stop. Let the child live. It has done no harm. The father has done harm, Richard swallowed. Children are not necessarily evil just because the father was. If the father is evil, then the child will be as he. That is not true, the sister said. Richard's father was an evil man who killed many people. Yet Richard seeks to preserve life. His mother knew that the guilt of crimes does not pass beyond the one who commits them. She did not spare her love because Richard's father raped her. Richard was raised by good people who taught him right. Because of that, you are alive today. You can teach the child right. Du Shailu's fury faltered as she looked to Richard. Is this true? Your mother was treated as I by an evil dog? Richard could only manage a nod. She rubbed her belly. I will consider what you say before I decide. You have returned my life. I will weigh your words. Richard squeezed her shoulder. Whatever you decide, I'm sure it will be for the best. If she lives long enough to decide, Sister Verna said, You've made promises and threats that you cannot fulfill. When the Majendi plant their crops and nothing happens, they will lose their fear of what you have told them today. What you've done will count for nothing, and they will once again make war on her people, to say nothing of mine. Richard pulled the leather thong with the birdman's whistle off over his head. I wouldn't exactly say nothing is going to happen, sister. Something is indeed going to happen. He hung the whistle around Du Shailu's neck. This was a gift to me, and now my gift to you, so that you can stop the killing. He held the carved bone up. This is a magic whistle. It calls birds, more birds than you've ever seen in one place before. I'm counting on you to fulfill my promise. You are to go to their planting fields. Keep yourself hidden. Then, at sunset, blow on this magic whistle. You will hear no sound, but the birds will be called by the magic. In your mind, keep picturing birds. 
Think of all the birds you know as you blow on the whistle and keep blowing until they come. She touched the carved bone whistle. Magic? The birds will truly come? He gave her a one-sided smile. Oh, yes, they'll come. There is no doubt of that. The magic will call them. No person will hear the sound, but the birds will. The Majendi will not know it's you who calls the birds. The birds will be hungry and will devour all the seed. Every time the Majendi plants seeds, you call the birds and take it away from them. She grinned. The Majendi will starve to death. Richard put his face close to hers. No, this is my gift to you to stop the killing, not a gift to help you kill. You will call the birds to steal their seed until the Majendi agree to live in peace with you. When they have fulfilled their part of the bargain, you must fulfill your part and agree to live in peace with them. He put his first finger right in front of her nose. If you misuse my gift, I will come back and use other magic against your people. I've placed my trust in you to do right. Do not fail my trust. Du Shailu averted her eyes. She gave a little sniff. I will do right. I will use your gift as you say. She tucked the whistle into her dress. Thank you for helping to bring peace to my people. That's my greatest hope. Peace. Peace, Sister Verna huffed. She directed a smoldering glare to Richard. You think it's so simple? You think that after 3,000 years you can simply decree that the killing will stop? You think all it takes is your mere presence and the ways of people will change? You are a naive child. Though the crimes of the father do not pass on to the son, you have a simplistic way of seeing things that brings harm just the same. If you think, sister, that I would be a party to human sacrifices for any reason, you are seriously mistaken. He started to turn away, but then turned back. What harm have I brought? What killing have I started? She leaned toward him. Well, for one thing, if we don't help ones with the gift like you, it will kill them as it would kill you. How do you propose we get those boys to the palace? We can no longer cross the Majendi's land. She glanced at Du Shailu. She has only given you pass through her land. She has not said we may bring others through. She straightened. Those boys will die because of what you have done. Richard thought about it a moment. He was exhausted. Using the sword's magic had wearied him as it never had before. He wanted nothing more than to sleep. He didn't feel like solving problems or arguing. At last he looked to Du Shailu. When you make peace with the Majendi, before you let them plant once again, you must add another condition. You must tell them that in honor of the killing being brought to an end, in honor of the peace, they will let the sisters cross their land. She watched his eyes a moment before she finally nodded. Your people will do the same. He narrowed his eyes at the sister. Satisfied? In the valley, when you struck down a beast, a thousand snakes sprang forth from its corpse. This is no different. It would be impossible, she said, for me to accurately recall all the lies you've told today. I've reprimanded you before for lying and cautioned you not to do it again. I told you not to swing the axe today, and you did it anyway, despite my warning. I can scarcely tally all the commands you've managed to violate in this one day. What you have done has not finished the killing, but only begun it. In this, sister, I am the seeker, not your student. As seeker, I have no tolerance for human sacrifice. None. The deaths of others are a separate issue. You cannot use it as a link to justify murder. There will be no compromise in this. And I don't think you want to punish me for stopping something I would wager you wish had been stopped long ago. The muscles in her face relaxed. As a sister of the light, I have no power to change things. And under obligation to save more lives, I had to uphold what has been for 3,000 years. But I admit I hated it. And in a way, I'm glad you have taken it out of my hands. But that does not negate the trouble it will cause, or the deaths. When you put the Radahan on, you told me that holding the leash to that collar would be worse than wearing it. Your words are proving true. Her lower eyelids filled with glistening moisture. You have made my greatest love, my calling, a misery. I am past wanting to punish you for your disobedience. In a few days we will be at the palace, and I will at last be finished with you. They will have to deal with you. We shall see how they handle you when you displease them. I believe you will find they are not prepared to be as tolerant as I have been. They will use that collar. And when they do, I also think they will come to regret holding your leash more than do I. 
I think they will come to regret trying to help you, as do I. Richard put his hands in his back pockets as he stared off at the thick forest of oak and leather leaf. I'm sorry you feel that way, sister, and I guess I can understand it. Although I admit I have fought being your prisoner, this today was not about you and me. This was about what is right. As one who would wish to teach me, I would hope you shared that moral stance. I would hope the sisters would not want to teach the use of the gift to one who could easily bend his convictions to the circumstance. Sister Verna, I was not trying to displease you. I simply could not live with myself if I allowed a murder to take place under my nose, much less participated in it. I know, Richard, but that only makes it worse because it's all one and the same. She unclasped her hands and peered about at the fire and their supplies, finally pulling a cake of soap from a saddlebag. I'll make a stew and bannock. She tossed the cake of soap to him. Du Shailu needs a bath. Du Shailu folded her arms in a huff. While I was chained to a wall, the dogs who came to mount me did not offer me water so I would smell pretty for you. Sister Verna squatted down, pulling supplies out. I meant no offense, Du Shailu. I simply thought you would want to wash the dirt of those men off you. If it were me, I would want nothing more than to try to wash the feel of their hands from my flesh. Du Shailu's indignation faltered. Well, of course I would. She snatched the soap from Richard. You smell of that beast you ride. You will wash too, or I will not want to be near you and will send you off to eat by yourself. Richard chuckled. If it will keep the peace with you, I'll wash too. As Du Shailu marched off toward the pond, Sister Verna called quietly to him. He waited next to her while she pulled a pot from a saddlebag. Her people have been killing any magic man they could get their hands on for the last 3,000 years. There is no time to give you history lessons. She looked up to his eyes. Old habits spring to hand as easily as a knife. Don't turn your back on her. Sooner or later, she is going to try to kill you. Her quiet tone unexpectedly raised bumps on his flesh. I'll try to keep myself alive, sister, so you can deliver me to the palace and at last be free of your onerous charge. Richard hurried toward the pond and caught up with Du Shailu as she was walking through the reeds. Why did you call that your prayer dress? Du Shailu held her arms out, letting the breeze ruffle the strips of cloth on her dress. These are prayers. What are prayers? You mean the strips of cloth? She nodded. Each is a prayer. When the wind blows and they fly, each sends a prayer to the spirits. And what do you pray for? Every one of these prayers is the same from the heart of the person who gave me their prayer. They are all prayers to have our land returned to us. Your land? But you are in your land. No, this is where we live, but it is not our land. Many ages ago, our land was taken by the magic men. They banished us here. They reached the edge of the pond. Puffs of breeze drew up ripples in dark patches. The bank was grassy with thick patches of rushes to each side, extending out into the water. The magic men took your land? What land? They took our land from our ancestors. She pointed in the direction of the Valley of the Lost. The land on the other side of the Majendi. I was going to our land with our prayers to ask the spirits if they would help our land be returned to us. But the Majendi caught me, and I was not able to take our prayers to the spirits. How will the spirits return your land to you? She shrugged. The old words say only that we must send one every year to our land to pray to the spirits, and if we do, our land will be returned. She untied her belt and slipped it to the ground. With unsettling grace, she tossed the green-handled knife aside, sticking it in the round end of a branch on a log. How? She gave him a curious frown. By sending us our master. I thought you were the Bakaban Mana, those without masters. She shrugged. Because the spirits have not sent us one yet. While Richard was puzzling over this, she reached down, took hold of her dress, and pulled it off over her head. What do you think you're doing? She frowned. It is me that I must wash, not my dress. Well, not in front of me. She looked down at herself. You have already seen me. I have not grown any different since this morning. She looked up at him. Your face is red again. Over there, he pointed. Go on the other side of the rushes. You on one side and me on the other. He turned his back to her. But we have only one soap. Well, you can throw it to me when you're through. 
She came around to the front of him. He tried to turn again, but she followed him around, grabbing at his buttons. I cannot scrub my own back, and it is not fair. You have seen me, so I should see you. That is why you are turning red, because you have not been fair. This will make you feel better. He slapped her hands away. Stop it. To Shailu, where I come from, this is not proper. Men and women do not bathe together. It's just not done. He turned his back to her again. Not even my third husband is as shy as you. Third? You have had three husbands? No, I have five. Richard stiffened. Have? He turned to her. What do you mean, have? She looked at him as if he had asked if trees grew in the forest. I have five husbands, five husbands and my children. And how many of those do you have? Three, two girls and a boy. A wistful smile came to her. It is a long time since I have held them. Her smile turned sad. My poor babies will have cried every night thinking I am dead. No one ever returned from the Majendi before. She grinned. My husbands will be anxious to draw lots to see who will be the first to try to give me another child. Her smile faded, and her voice trailed off. But I guess a Majendi dog has already done that. Richard handed her the soap. It will all turn out fine, you'll see. Go bathe. I'll go on the other side of the rushes. He relaxed in the cool water, listening to her splash, waiting for her to finish with the soap. A mist thickened over the pond, stealing slowly, silently, into the surrounding trees. I've never heard of a woman having more than one husband. Do all the Bakabanmana have more than one husband? She giggled. No, only me. Why you? The water stopped splashing. Because I wear the prayer dress, she said, as if it should be self-evident. Richard rolled his eyes. Well, what does... She came swimming through the rushes toward him. Before you can have the soap, you must wash my back. Richard let out an aggravated sigh. All right, if I wash your back, will you then go back on your side? She presented her back to him. If you do a proper job. When she was satisfied, she finally went back to get dressed while he washed. She told him over the chirp of bugs and the trill of frogs that she was hungry. He was pulling his pants on while she called for him to hurry so they could eat. He threw his shirt over his shoulder and ran to catch up with her as she headed toward the smell of cooking. She looked much better clean. Her hair looked like a normal person's instead of a wild animal's. She looked no more like a savage, but somehow noble. It wasn't dark yet, but getting close to it. The mist that had formed over the pond was drifting in around them from behind. The trees were disappearing in the gathering fog. As the two of them stepped into the ring of light around the fire, Sister Verna stood. Richard was putting his right arm through his sleeve when he froze at the wide-eyed look on Sister Verna's face. She was staring at his chest, at the thing he had never let her see before. At the scar, at the handprint burned there, at the handprint that was a constant reminder of who fathered him. Sister Verna was as white as a spirit. Her voice was so soft he had to strain to hear her. Where did you get that? Du Shailu was staring at the scar, too. Richard pulled his shirt closed. I told you before, Dark and Rahl burned me with his hand. You said I was only having visions. Her gaze slowly rose to meet his. Her eyes were filled with something he had never seen in them before. Unbridled fear. Richard, she whispered, you must not show anyone at the palace what you have upon you. Except the prelate. She may know what to do. You must show her, but no one else. She stepped closer. Do you understand? No one. Richard slowly buttoned his shirt. Why? Because if you do, they will kill you. That is the mark of the nameless one. Her tongue wet her lips. Sins of the father. From the distance came the plaintive howl of wolves. Du Shailu shuddered and hugged herself as she stared off into the deepening fog. Keeper will die tonight, Du Shailu whispered. Richard frowned at her. What are you talking about? Wolves? When wolves howl like that in the mist, they are foretelling that people are to die violently in the night, in the mist. Chapter 44 They materialized out of fog and mist the white fangs of death. The startled prey, at first immobilized by bone-chilling fright, jumped to flee before the white death. Fangs of white steel ripped into them without mercy as they bolted for their lives. Death squeals tore the night air with their terror. Hysteria sent them running heedlessly onto the waiting cold white steel. 
Fearless men tasted fear before they died. Pandemonium spread on a wild uproar of noise, the ringing chime of steel, the splintering of wood, the ripping of canvas, the groan of leather, the pop of bones, the whoosh of fire, the crash of wagons, the thuds of flesh and bone hitting ground, and the screams of man and beast all joined into one long cacophony of terror. The wave of white death drove the tumult before it. The sharp smell of blood washed through the air over the sweet aroma of blazing wood, the acrid tang of igniting lamp oil, the smoky smack of flaming pitch and the gagging stench of burning fur and flesh. What wasn't wet with the cold mist was greasy slick with hot blood. The white steel fangs now were coated with blood and gore. White snow became a soggy mat of red splashes. The cold air was seared by gouts of flame that leapt up to turn the white fog an incandescent orange. Sinister dark clouds of smoke hugged the ground while the sky burned overhead. Arrows zipped past. Spears arced through the air. Splintered lances spun away into the mist and severed pikeheads whirled off into the darkness. Remnants of torn tents flapped and fluttered as if battered by a furious storm. Swords rose and fell in waves driven by the grunts that accompanied frantic effort. Men ran in every direction like frenzied ants. Some tumbled to the ground, spilling their viscera across the snow. Some of the wounded, blinded by blood, stumbled aimlessly until a white shadow swept by, a spirit of death cutting him down. A wagon wheel bounced past, its progress quickly obscured from view by dark curtains of acrid smoke that drifted past. No alarm had been raised. The sentries were long dead. Few in camp had realized what was happening until it was upon them. The camp of the Imperial Order had lately been a place of noise and wild celebration, and for many, in their drunken state, it was hard to tell that anything of consequence was happening. Many of the men, poisoned by the bandu in the ale, lay sick around fires. Many were so weak they burned to death without trying to escape flaming tents. Others were in such a drunken stupor that they actually smiled at the men who drove swords through their guts. Even the ones who were not drunk, or who were not drunk to the point of dullness, didn't truly appreciate what was happening. Their camp was often a place of raucous noise and confusion. Huge bonfires roared throughout the night for warmth and as gathering places. They were generally the only reference points in the disorderly layout, so the fires of destruction caused little concern, except in the immediate area. Among the Harans, fighting in the camps was simply part of the revelry, and men screaming when they were stabbed in altercations was not noteworthy. What one had was only his if he was fierce enough to keep it from others who were always ready to take it. Alliances among the Harans were shifting sands that could last a lifetime, or more commonly for as little as an hour, when a new alliance became more advantageous or profitable. The drinking and the poison dulled their grasp of the sheer volume of screams. In battle they were disciplined, but when not in battle, they were ungoverned to the point of anarchy. Pay for the Harans on expeditions was in large part a share of the plunder. They had looted Ebenissia, despite all their talk of a new law, and having that new plunder made them perhaps less than single-minded in their devotion to duty. At battle, or the first sound of an alarm, they became a single unified fighting machine, almost an entity of one mind. But in camp, without the overriding purpose of war, they became thousands of individuals all bent on serving their own self-interest. Without an alarm to warn them, they paid the added noise and screaming little attention. Above the noise of their own business, trading, stories, laughter, drinking, gambling, fighting, and whoring, the unheralded battle a short distance away went largely unnoticed. The officers would call them if needed. Without that call to duty, their life was their own, and someone else's troubles were not theirs. They were unprepared when the white death materialized. The sight of white spirits appearing among them was a paralyzing force. Many a man wailed in fear of the Shahari spirits. Many envisioned that the separation between the world of the living and the world of the dead had evaporated, or that they had somehow been suddenly cast into the underworld. Without the ale, both poisoned and unadulterated, it might not be so. As it was, the drink and their confidence in their numbers and strength left them vulnerable as they would never be again. But not all were drunk or dull. Some rose up fiercely. Kaelin watched it all from atop her dancing warhorse. In a sea of raw, unbridled emotion, she wore her confessor's face. These men were neither moral nor ethical. They were animals who lived by no rule but might. 
They had raped the women at the palace and had mercilessly butchered the people of Ebenissia, from the aged down to newborn babes. A man lunged through the ring of steel around her, grabbing at her saddle for support. He gaped at her, crying a prayer for mercy from the good spirits. She split his skull. Kalin wheeled her horse to face Sergeant Cullen. Have we captured the command tents? The sergeant signaled, and one of the white naked men ran off to check as they drove deeper into the camp of the order. When she spotted the horses, she gave the signal. From behind, she heard the sound of galloping hooves and the sharp rattle of chains. Scythes of death come to reap a crop of the living. With a sound like a boy running past a picket fence with a stick in hand, the chain scythes being pulled at a full charge reaped a snapping of bone that meshed into a long, clacking roar. The beasts' screams and the dull thuds as they slammed the ground drowned out the sound of galloping hooves and breaking bone. Even the drunken enemy turned from the white spirits to stare at the ghastly spectacle. It was the last thing they saw. Men stumbled from their tents to watch without understanding what it was that was occurring before their eyes. Others wandered aimlessly, mugs in hand, as if at a fair, drunkenly looking from one side to another. There were so many, some had to wait a bit for their turn to die. Some were not drunk and saw not spirits, but men painted white. They saw an attack and understood well-honed blades coming for them. A pocket of fierce counterattack was surrounded and broken, but not without cost. Kaelin rallied her men and drove her wedge of white steel deeper into the heart of the enemy's camp. She saw two men on huge draft horses. She couldn't see who they were. Having cut down all the horses they could find, take to charging down a line of tents, reaping havoc as well as helpless men. The chain caught something as solid as bedrock. It whipped the horses around into a brutal collision. The riders went down. Men with swords and axes swarmed over them. A man with sword to hand and sober, she was alarmed to note, appeared suddenly next to her leg. He looked up with a fierce glare. His sharp eyes made her feel suddenly nothing more than a naked woman sitting on a horse. He took all of her in. What the? A foot of steel erupted from his breastbone, driving a grunt from his lungs. Mother Confessor! The naked man behind yanked his sword free and pointed with it. The command tents are over there. A movement to the other side caught her attention. With a backhanded swing, she caught the side of a stumbling drunk's neck. Let's go to the command tents, now. Her men abandoned the enemy they were decimating to follow her as she jumped Nick over men and fires and crumpled wagons. As they followed, they didn't stop to slaughter the confused, panicked, and drunken Daharans everywhere, but cut down those they could if it didn't slow their pace. Where necessary, they engaged the sporadic resistance. The large command tents were surrounded by her white Galeans. They held a small group of about 15 men at sword point. Before them lay a neat row of at least 30 bodies on their backs in the snow. Others of her men were throwing battle standards and flags atop a large pile already smoldering and burning in the fire. Empty casks lay scattered in the snow. When their army had come under attack, the commanders had issued no orders. The army of the Imperial Order was without benefit of direction. Lieutenant Sloan pointed with his sword to the line of bodies. These officers were already dead. The poison did its work. These others were still alive, although not in the best of health. They were all lying about in their tents. We could hardly get them up. They asked us for rum, if you can believe it. We've held them, like you said. Kaylin surveyed the faces of the bodies in the snow. She didn't see what she wanted. She looked to the faces of the captured officers. He wasn't there either. She directed her confessor's face to a Celtish officer at the end of the line. Where's Riggs? He glared at her and then spat. Kaylin lifted her gaze to the man holding him. She drew her finger across her throat. He didn't hesitate. The officer went down in a heap. She looked to the next officer. Where's Riggs? His eyes darted about. I don't know. Kaylin drew her finger across her throat. As he went down, she looked to the next man, a Daharan commander. Where's Riggs? His eyes were wide, but not at the two bleeding bodies beside him. His horror was for her, a spirit before him. He wet his lips. He was hurt by the mother confessor. I mean, by you, before. His voice trembled. When you were alive. Where is he? He winced, shaking his head vigorously. I don't know, great spirit. He was hurt. His face was cut by the horse. He is being tended to by the surgeons. 
I don't know where their tents are. Who knows where the surgeon's tents are? Most trembled and shuddered as they shook their heads. Kaylin stepped her horse down the line of officers. She stopped before one she knew. General Karsh, I am very pleased to see you again. Where's Riggs? Wouldn't tell you if I knew. He grinned as he leered up at her. You look better naked than I fancied. Why are you whoring with this lot? We could do you better than these boys. The man holding him twisted his arm until he cried out. Show respect for the mother confessor, you Celtish pig. Respect? For a whore holding a sword? Never. Kalin leaned toward him. These boys have you under their blades. Every one is a better man than you, I would say. You wanted war, Karsh. You have your wish. You have war now. A real war, not a slaughter of women and children, but a war led by me, the mother confessor, a woman. War without quarter. She sat up straight in her saddle, letting his eyes linger on her breasts. I have a message, Karsh. A message for the keeper. You will be with him presently. Tell him I said to make plenty of room. I'm sending all his disciples home. Her gaze swept down the line of men holding the officers. She drew her finger across her throat in a quick gesture. The response was just as quick. As the bodies tumbled forward, she cried out, her hand darting to her neck. A stinging pain jolted her. It was in the exact same place. It was the pain of Dark and Rawl's lips on her neck, the pain she had felt when he had come to them in the spirit house, when he had burned Richard with his hand, when he had kissed her neck and silently promised her unimaginable horrors. Men rushed forward. Mother Confessor, what is it? She took her hand away. Blood coated her white fingers. She couldn't say how she knew, but she knew without doubt that the blood was drawn by the perfect snow-white teeth of Dark and Rawl. Mother Confessor, there's blood on your neck. It's nothing. I'm all right. I must have just been nicked by an arrow, that's all. She gathered her wits and courage. Put the head of every officer on a pole for all their men to see to let them know they are without leaders, and hurry. By the time the last dripping head was hoisted up, Daharans were pouring in from all sides. Most were drunk, laughing as if it were nothing more than a drunken brawl. But inefficient and clumsy as they were, their numbers were alarming. They were like a swarm of bees. For every one knocked down, ten replaced him. Her men fought fiercely, but they were no match for the overwhelming numbers sweeping in. Men she had talked to, reassured, inspired, yelled at, and smiled to were falling with cries of pain and terror. They had been here too long. Ahead, a pitched battle erupted. The Galeans were being driven back. If they were driven back, they had no chance of escape. They couldn't go back the way they had come, back to men who would have had time to have been sobered by the carnage around them, to gather their senses and their spirit. Without surprise, they were nothing but a bunch of naked boys and one woman. If they tried a second time what had worked once, they would all die. They had to cleave their way through the order to the other side of the valley. Daharans hacked in at the white forms. Her ankle was grasped by a powerful hand. She hewed it off and shook her foot to shed the disembodied hand. They were in danger of being swallowed into the belly of this beast. Disregarding the death cries of her men, disregarding her promise not to leave the protective ring of the fiercest Galean swordsmen, disregarding her promise not to deliberately put herself into peril, Kalin charged Nick into the thick of the battle and beyond into the enemy. Her sword stabbed to each side into any enemy close enough. Teeth gritted, she swung at flesh and bone. Her wrist tingled from the jarring impacts, and her arm was so weary she feared she would not be able to lift the sword much longer. Frightened that she would be taken down, her men poured ahead toward her with renewed resolve. They drove the dark wave back, rolling over it as she urged her horse forward into the sea of dark leather uniforms. She stood in the stirrups, holding her sword high. For Ebenezia! For her dead! For her spirit! It had the desired effect. Men of the order who were confused by the white enemy but were nonetheless determined to crush them, whatever they were, stopped and stared openly at a white, naked woman atop a horse, suddenly in their midst. Their faith that the attack was from men and not spirits faltered. They gaped in open astonishment. She swept her gaze around at all the eyes peering up at her. She swung the white sword in a circle over her head as a breeze ruffled her white hair back off her shoulders. In the name of their spirits, I have come to avenge them. 
Leather-clad men fell to their knees, dropping their swords, pressing prayerful hands together. They held those hands up to her. They wailed for protection. They called for her mercy. They cried for forgiveness. Had they been sober, she wondered, would the illusion be so convincing? As it was, the effect was apocalyptic. We grant no quarter. As all faces stared up toward her, as eyes shed tears of trepidation, weapons set upon them from behind. The sudden, violent, merciless wave of hard steel terrified them, convinced them that the spirits would have them all. They broke and ran, dropping weapons, screaming in fear of the underworld. They had done what they had come to do. Time was now against them. They needed to escape. They charged onward, a deadly swift river of white that poured over and around the tents and fires and wagons and men, surprising even more of the lethargic enemy, killing as many as they could while rolling ahead. White death moved into the mist once again. Kalin glanced behind and saw the pairs of draft horses, their riders holding the chains up between them. She waved them into the stream of white, urging them to move faster. They started unhooking one end of the chains from the hame hooks and looping the chain over the horn on the other horse to give each horse freedom now that they needed to make a quick escape. In the distance, in the fog to the right, she saw a line of picketed horses. She saw Bryn and Peter come together, snap the end of the chain over the other hook again, and urge Daisy and Pip into gallops. She thought to scream at them, to order them to keep with the others, that they couldn't hope to get them all, that they had done enough and must leave now, that it was too late. But she knew they wouldn't hear her. Bryn dropped the loops of chain. They spread the horses to pull the steel taut as they peeled away toward the picket line of horses. The hooves of the big horses thundered across the ground. She took a last look at Bryn and Peter, knowing it would be the last time she ever looked upon them in this world, and then turned her attention ahead. She pointed with her sword. There are the rest of the supply wagons. The men knew what to do. As she charged the column past, the wagons were doused with lamp oil. Wheels were staved in and torches thrown. The wagons erupted in flame. More torches set fire to tents. The men brought awake by the noise and fire found blades sweeping at them. The fires faded into an orange glow in the mist behind as they plunged onward into the fog. Suddenly, they broke free of the camp and were in open snow. Now that they were away from the camp and its fires, the darkness pressed around them. The men in front faltered, looking about as they jogged. Scouts forward, she yelled. Where are the scouts? Two men charged through the ranks to the fore, pointing out the direction of the pass they sought. She looked for the others, turning from side to side. None came. She galloped Nick to the van after the two scouts. Where are the others? They were ordered to be in the lead. The round, wet eyes that looked up at her answered her question without words. All right, she said. You two know the way. Get us out of here. Fifty men had scouted the pass they wanted. Fifty, to be sure, there would be a good number left to show the way. Two were left. With a silent growl, she cursed the spirits. Shamefaced, she called the curse back. They had at least left her those two. Without them, they would be left to wander in the fog, freezing and vincible to the men of the order chasing them. She pulled Nick to a halt beside the stream of naked men. She swooped her arm frantically. Move, move, move! Run, curse you, run! They'll be on top of us! The men on the draft horses, Bryn and Peter not among them, came abreast of her. Drivers, watch for the scout ahead. He'll show you the stakes to follow. They nodded that they remembered. Men in Daharan uniforms with white cloth swatches sewn into their epaulets to show that they were, in fact, the Galean men who had infiltrated the enemy camp in the uniforms of the sentries, ran past. Don't forget to pull up the stakes before you get up on the horses. They were to double or triple up on the draft horses and ride to one of the other small camps established around the enemy. Earlier in the day, they had made trails all over the valley so that without the sticks stuck in the snow to mark the proper trail, none would know the way to those camps. The trail through the snow from all the men on foot would be easy for the enemy to follow, but they had plans to take care of that. In the distance, back toward the order, she saw the rear guard engaged in a pitched battle. Lieutenant Sloan was supposed to keep that from happening and keep the rear moving. Cursing anew, she galloped her horse back. Without pause, she charged between the two forces, spun and charged through again, separating the two sides. The leather-clad Daharans fell back at the sight of the white spirit woman atop a white horse. She waded in among the Galeans. What's the matter with you? You know the orders? Run or you won't make it! The men started moving, trying to drag a body with them. 
Where's Lieutenant Sloan? He's supposed to be back here. The men nodded to the body they were dragging. The side of the head was gone, and she could see the exposed brain. It was Lieutenant Sloan. The Daharans charged in again. She pulled the reins, and Nick reared. The Daharans fell back once more. He's dead. Leave him. Run! Run, you idiots! If any of you stops again for anything, I'll make you fight the rest of this war naked. Now run! This time they took off in earnest, kicking up snow, running for their lives. Again she swept past the line of drunken Daharans, causing them to stumble backward and fall over one another in panic. She had to stall these men to give her own time to gain enough of a lead. She ran Nick through the Daharans, trampling those who got in the way. The men scattered in momentary dread of the white spirit woman, some calling to the spirits for protection. But others came back swinging weapons. If they caught Nick's legs, she fought back with her sword and her war horse as they closed around her. Her men were fading into the fog. Run, she bid them, run. She swung the sword at men who reached out. The next time she glanced back, she saw nothing but dark fog and mist. She was losing her sense of direction as she wheeled Nick around, charging at the men, trying to buy her own men the time they needed to escape. She tried to break away, but the enemy swarmed around her with more coming all the time. Some yelled at the others that she was just a woman and not a spirit, and that they weren't going to let a woman get away. She felt more naked than she had felt all night. Men threw themselves around Nick's legs, and although he reared and kicked them off, even more took their place, staggering the big horse with their weight. Kalin hacked furiously at the men, shearing off arms, splitting skulls, and stabbing bodies. With a sea of men all around her, she suddenly realized that her situation was untenable. She knew that if they got her off her horse, she was finished, and her horse was being hobbled. Try as she might, she couldn't get the men away. For the first time that night, she truly feared she wasn't going to make it. She was going to die, here in the snow, in this mist-shrouded valley. She would never see Richard again. She felt an abrupt icy pain in the bite on her neck, dark and Rawls' bite. She thought she heard quiet laughter in the air. She slashed away at the men grabbing for her. Powerful fingers clutched her legs. The pain of those fingers urged her into frantic stabbing. Nick managed to spin, the men's feet flying outward, but they held on tight. She slashed and hacked the arms. More caught hold of her horse's bit, taking control from her. A horse was valuable plunder, and they didn't want it killed as long as they thought they were in control of the situation. A big soldier grabbed the horn of her saddle, dragging himself up. Don't kill her. It's the murder confessor. Don't kill her. She must be alive when she's beheaded. She slashed the side of his neck. A fountain of hot blood gushed across her thigh. Another yelled, Don't kill her. Bring the bitch down. A cheer went up from the reaching men. She swung at the grasping hands. Fingers raked her legs. Eyes all around leered up at her. She slashed wildly as Nick stumbled sideways, trying to pull his head free, but the men held his bit tight. A man leapt up from behind and snatched her by the hair. She let out a cry as he yanked her backward off the saddle. Hands grappled her as she tumbled to the ground. Everyone went down in a pile under her. Big hands seized her by her legs, her waist, her ankles, and her breasts. Fingers wrapped around the blade, trying to wrench it from her. She twisted the hilt, severing the fingers. She swung and stabbed ferociously. Bodies pressed her to the cold ground, pressed the wind from her lungs. She bit the fingers, covering her mouth. A huge fist struck her across the jaw. They finally seized her flailing arms. There were too many. Dear Richard, I love you. Chapter 45 Kaylin struggled to draw a breath. But with the weight of men on her, she couldn't. Tears stung her eyes. More men piled on. A beefy elbow in her middle pressed into her, feeling as if it would squash her in two. Drunken breath bathed her face. Her vision dwindled to a small spot. Everything around the center was going black, and the center was shrinking. She swallowed a mouthful of blood, her own. She heard what sounded like the distant rumble of thunder. At first... She could only feel the vibration in her back against the ground. But then the sound swelled, growing louder, sharper. The screams of men reached her ears. Some of the men over her looked up. Their weight lifted a bit, and she sucked air into her lungs. It was the sweetest breath she had ever drawn. As the giant of a man atop her, the one who had struck her face turned to the sound of thunder, turned his fierce eye from her. She saw that his other had a scar across it and down his cheek. The empty eye was sewn shut. Somehow, her left hand squirmed free. 
She seized his throat. She heard a metallic rattle. The thunder, she suddenly realized, was horses' hooves. Erupting out of the fog, Bryn and Peter, atop Daisy and Pip, galloped at a full charge down the line of Daharans, mowing them down with the chain. They raced toward her like a landslide felling trees. The men stared in frozen shock. Kalin's fingers clutched around the one-eyed man's throat. And then she released her power. The magic slammed into him. Thunder without sound rattled all the chain mail. The staggering jolt made the men flinch back. They all cried out with the pain of being so close as the magic was loosed. A ring of snow lifted, sweeping outward in a circle. Nick was standing over her, and he jumped with the pain, too. His hind leg came down on a man's head right next to her ear. Bone crunched under the weight. Hot blood and gore splattered the side of her face. The one eye of the man above her gaped at her. Mistress, he whispered, please command me. Protect me, she screamed. He sat up abruptly, his massive muscles bulging. He held the hair of a man in each fist. He tossed them back as if they were mere children. Her sword arm was free. She swung at a man to the other side, the blade ruining his face. The one-eyed man roared as he tossed men aside. The draft horses rushed onward at a full charge. She was free of the hands. She leaped to her feet. The chain was almost upon them. Help me up on my horse. The one-eyed man grabbed her ankle in his big fist and with one arm boosted her up into the saddle. Somehow she still had the sword in her hand. She leaned forward and swung it at the man holding the bit, holding his prize. The sword's tip sliced open the side of his face and half the length of his arm. He staggered back with a shriek. She snatched up the reins. The one-eyed man bellowed as he lopped off heads and ripped open chests with his huge war axe. Go, mistress, escape. Orsk will protect you. I'm going. Run, Orsk. Don't let them get you. The Daharans abandoned her and her horse to turn to the new threats, Orsk and the chain. She thumped Nick's ribs with her heels, urging him into a gallop just as Bryn and Peter caught up with her. She stuffed her bare feet into the stirrups as the three of them raced away. She spotted the trail that hundreds of feet had left in the snow and followed it across the valley into the mist, leaving the men of the Army of the Order to collect their wits. It took them mere seconds. They charged after her. There were more than enough still alive. Thousands. Peter unhooked the chain that must have broken hundreds of bones and necks. The end of the chain bounced behind. Bryn's bony fingers drew in the dragging slack and coiled it over the haim. As she galloped into the night, she thought she could hear the sound of soft laughter fading behind. She shivered with the memory of the kiss Dark and Rahl had left on her neck. She felt suddenly very naked again. Though the mist was icy cold, feeling like sparkling flecks all over her, she was sweating. Blood ran from her swollen lip. I never thought I would see you two again! She yelled over the sound of hooves. Bryn and Peter, in their two big coats, grinned in the darkness. We told you we could do the job, Bryn said. She smiled for the first time that night. You two are a marvel. She just caught sight of the hindquarters of the other draft horses disappearing into the fog. She pointed. There are your men. Good luck. With a wave, they turned away from her. She galloped on alone, and a short distance later caught up with the men on foot. She first saw only one. He had a horrific gash on his leg and had fallen far behind. She knew she should leave him. She knew she should. The Daharans were right behind. As she rode up to him, he turned his head up as he struggled through the snow. He knew she had to leave him. Those were the orders, her orders. Keep up or be left behind, no exceptions. As she rode by, she leaned over, extending her arm down. They clasped wrists and she yanked him up behind her. Hold on, soldier. He held his arms out, trying to balance as the horse ran, afraid to touch her. But where? Around my waist. Put your arms around my waist. He still held his arms out as he bounced. But haven't you ever put your arms around a woman before? Yes, but she had clothes on, he whined. Do it or you'll fall off, and I'm not coming back for you. Reluctantly, carefully, he put his arms around her waist, stiffly trying to keep them away from anything important or unfamiliarly exotic. Kalin gave the back of his hands a pat of reassurance. When you brag about this, don't make it more than it is. He let out a small, worried groan that made her smile. As they rode on, she could feel his warm blood running down the back of her leg, dripping from her toes in the stirrup. 
She could hear the shouts of the enemy chasing behind. He was losing a lot of blood. In exhaustion, he laid his head against the back of her shoulder. If they didn't tie his wound closed, he would bleed to death in short order. She was naked and had nothing to use as a bandage, even if they had the time to stop. Hold the wound closed with a hand, she said. Clamp it closed as tight as you can, and hold fast to me with your other arm. I don't want you falling off. He took one arm from her waist and held the gash closed as she rode right on the heels of the men at the end of the line. They were cold and fatigued. The men of the order were not far behind. As she looked back, they came into sight. She was shocked by the numbers. They hooted and hollered. Run! Run or we will be caught! A wall of rock with scraggly trees growing from cracks and clefts loomed up before them. The men ran up the narrow pass as if their lives depended on it. And they did. As they began to climb up the rift, she rang the flat of her sword three times on the rock, giving the signal. A man ahead turned as he ran. We're not there yet. It's too soon. We'll be caught along with the enemy. Then you better run faster. If we wait too long, they will get through too. She wrapped the rock wall three more times, the ringing sound carrying into the dark, damp air. She hoped it would work. There, of course, had been no way to perform a test. The men ahead scrambled up the trail. Nick's hooves slipped in places on the snow-covered rock. At first, she could only feel it, a rumbling deep in her chest, too low to hear, but too powerful not to be felt. She looked up along the mist-slicked rock that disappeared above into the darkened fog. She couldn't see it yet, but she could feel it. She hoped the man was wrong, that it wouldn't be too soon. When she heard the battle cries of the men coming from behind, she knew they had no choice. And then she could hear it, a booming roar, as if the ground itself were moving. She could hear tree trunks snapping. The thundering growl reverberated off the surrounding mountain walls. The ground vibrated. Run! Can't you run any faster? Do you want to be buried alive? Run! She knew they were going as fast as they could, but they were on foot. And from atop her horse, it seemed painfully slow, deadly slow. Overhead, the rumbling roar grew louder as uncountable tons of snow crashed down toward them. She was thrilled that the men on top had been successful in starting an avalanche on command, but she was also terrified that she had given the command too soon. A lump of wet snow slapped her face, another smacked her shoulder. Little clods rattled through the trees above them and bounced out over the edge. A cloud of fluffy snow misted her face. The roar was deafening. A flow of thundering white sluiced over the ledge above. They drove through it, like running through a waterfall. Behind her, a tree trunk bounced on the trail, spinning out over the precipice. They just cleared the leading edge of the bulk of snow. The men of the Imperial Order behind were not so lucky. The plunging snow, charged with timber and boulders, cascaded down with ever-gathering power. They were swept away in the tumbling white death. The fury of sound muffled the screams of men it carried away, rolling them into the pounding slide, burying them alive. Kalin sagged with relief. They could not be followed now. The pass was entombed. The panting men slowed, but they couldn't slow too much or they would freeze. Their pace kept them warm. Their feet, she knew, despite being wrapped in white cloth for a little protection, were not warm. They had given her their best effort. They had given the Midlands their best effort. Many had given their lives. Kalin was so exhausted from lack of sleep as well as the fatigue of battle, along with the emotional drain of fright and the effort required to use her power, that she could hardly stay upright. Soon, she told herself, she could rest. Soon. She patted the hand on her stomach. We made it, soldier. We're safe now. Yes, Mother Confessor, he whispered groggily. Mother Confessor, I'm sorry. For what? I only killed 17. I'm sorry. I promised myself I'd get 20. I only got 17, he mumbled. I know heroes of battle, decorated men, who have not bested half that number in combat. You have made me proud. You have made the Midlands proud. Feel only pride, soldier. He mumbled something she couldn't understand. She patted his hand again. You'll be to help soon. Hold on. You'll be fine. He didn't answer. She looked behind down the trail and saw only white and heard only silence. In the distant dark mountains, a wolf yipped. A short time later on a high plateau, they reached the camp. 
The men ahead in the line were already wrapped in blankets as they shivered around fires, warming their feet. Some were pulling on their clothes under the blankets. More men threw blankets around the men coming in ahead of her and tended the wounded. Some of the wounded were groaning in pain, feeling it for the first time now that the heady furor of combat and escape had evaporated. She began to feel a throbbing in her lip. In the flickering light of small fires, she could see Prindon and Tosidon some distance away, running around, searching the new arrivals. When they saw her on the horse, they both sighed with relief, giving her twin smiles. Captain Ryan, dressed in a Daharan uniform and with a bandage around his left hand, ran over. Other men took the reins, and yet others extended their hands to take the man behind her as she held him by an elbow, lowering the limp form down. Prindon ran to meet her, her mantle in hand. He stood, holding it open for her, waiting for her to dismount so he could put it around her shoulders. He grinned at her. Without moving from the saddle, she slowly extended her hand. I have had enough eyes on my flesh to last me the rest of my life. Throw it up here. Prindon shrugged self-consciously and tossed the mantle up to her. Tosidon swatted the back of his brother's head. Silence fell over the gathered men. They all looked away in embarrassment as she put the mantle around her shoulders and tied it. She slid down, finding her legs barely up to the task of holding her. She used the sword, still in her hand, as a cane. She had to pause a moment until everything stopped spinning. She glanced to the man lying in the snow at her feet. Why isn't someone helping this man? Don't just stand there, help him. No one moved. I said help him. Captain Ryan stepped closer to her. He kept his eyes on the ground. I'm sorry, Mother Confessor. He's dead. Her hand tightened into a fist. He's not dead. I was just talking to him. No one moved. She beat her free fist against his chest. He's not dead. He's not. Everyone looked away. No one said anything. She finally glanced at the men around the small fires, at all the hanging heads. Her hand fell to her side. He killed 17 of them, she said to Captain Ryan. He killed 17 of them, she said louder to the rest of them. Captain Ryan nodded. He did well. We are all proud of him. She watched the faces as they all finally came up. Forgive me, all of you. Please forgive me. You have all done a good job. The fury had gone out of her. You have all made me proud. You are heroes in my eyes and in the eyes of the Midlands. The men brightened a bit. Some went back to eating, while others started passing around tin bowls and spooned beans from pots on the fires. Some tore off chunks of flat camp bread to dunk in the beans. Where's Chandelin? she asked, as she pushed her feet into the boots Tosidon handed her. He went with the archers. I imagine that he's probably shooting arrows into Daharans right now. Captain Ryan leaned toward her as the brothers moved away and lowered his voice. I'm glad these three are on our side. You should have seen them taking out the sentries. Prindon especially is like death itself with that troga of his. It was eerie the way they were first here and then over there, and you never even saw them move. I never heard a thing. They just appeared with the sentries' uniforms. You should see them do that out in the open grassland in broad daylight. Kalin looked him up and down. She managed a small smile. Quite handsome. You wear it well. He pulled at his shoulder. I don't know how they wear this heavy mail all the time. He fingered a slash in the leather. But I was glad to have it on. How did everything go? How many men did you lose? We got nearly everything we went after. In these uniforms, we didn't have to do much fighting. Hardly anyone noticed us, except the ones we killed. We only lost a few men. He glanced back over his shoulder. Looks like you caught the worst of it. I took a rough count as you came in. We lost close to 400 of the thousand swordsmen who went in. She stared past him at the men around the fires. We came close to losing them all. She brought her attention back to the captain. But they did themselves proud. The drivers, too. He cradled his bandaged hand. From the ones I talked to, I don't think many took less than 10 of the enemy, and many took a lot more. We took quite a chunk out of the order's hide. Kalin swallowed. They took quite a chunk out of ours. Did the men do like I told them, he asked. Did they keep any trouble away from you? They kept the enemy so far from me I couldn't tell you what they looked like. I'm afraid I wasn't able to add much honor to your sword, though it was a comfort to have along. I pray you will at least be honored that I carried it in battle. He frowned, leaning to the side, trying to get a better look at her face in the firelight. Your lip looks cut. 
He glanced at her war horse as the men were taking the tack off. That horse is covered in blood. You're covered in blood too, aren't you? It was an accusation, not a question. Kalin stared off at a fire. Some drunk threw something at me. It cut my lip. That wounded soldier I was bringing in bled to death on my horse and on me. Her eyes drifted among the young faces around fires. I wish I could have done half as well as they. They were magnificent. He grunted suspiciously. I'm just relieved to see you. Is everything else in order? The archers, the cavalry? We must make the best use of our opportunity while they're drunk and sick with the poison. We must make the most of this weather, too. We can't let up for a moment. One lightning strike after another. No engagement. Glancing attacks always from a different place. They all know their jobs and are waiting their turn. The archers should be finished soon, then the cavalry, then the pikemen. We're ready for their sentries when they send them out. Our men will sleep in turns, but from now on the Imperial Order will get no sleep. Good. These men need rest. In the morning it will be their turn again. She lifted a finger to the captain. Remember the most important thing, she quoted her father. The weapon that most readily conquers reason is terror and violence. Don't forget that. It's the tool they use, and now we must turn it on them. Prindon came back into the firelight. Mother Confessor, my brother and I made you a shelter while we waited for your return. We have your clothes there, and hot water, so you may wash yourself if you wish. She tried not to show how eager she was to wash off the reek of war. Thank you, Prindon. He held his arm out, showing her the way to the small clearing. The brothers had built a roomy shelter of balsam boughs, covered over with snow. She crawled through the low opening to find candles inside. The snowy ground was covered with a mat of boughs, too, giving the shelter the pleasant aroma of balsam. A steaming bucket of water had just been set next to hot rocks placed in the center. She warmed her fingers over the rocks. The brothers had made her a warm and snug home for the night. She could have wept at their thoughtfulness. Her pack was there, and her clothes folded in a neat pile. Kaylin took off her necklace, the one Addie had given her, the one with the round bone. It was the only thing she had worn into battle. She clutched it to her cheek a moment before she washed it. It reminded her of the one her mother had given her. She dunked her whole head in the bucket, washed her hair, and then methodically washed the rest of herself. It was only a sponge bath, but it still felt wonderful to wash off the blood and the feel of the hands. She had to force herself to think of other things as she washed to keep from being sick. She thought of Richard, thought of his boyish smile that never failed to make her grin, thought of his gray eyes that could look right into her. When she finished washing, she lay down drying her hair on the rocks. She desperately needed sleep. She still hadn't recovered her confessor's power since using it on the one-eyed man, Orsk. She could feel the emptiness in the pit of her stomach, a hollow where the power belonged. It would be a while longer until it was restored. She wouldn't be able to shake the sick, dizzy exhaustion, though, until she had sleep. She longed to lie down in her bedroll and sleep. It had been so long, and she was so sleepy. But she couldn't. Not yet. She put the necklace back over her head and then laboriously pulled on her clothes. From her pack, she recovered an unguent and spread it on her cut lip. When she replaced it, she saw the bone knife Chandelin had given her and tied it around her arm again. She was so tired she could hardly force herself up, but she had something to do before she slept. She had to be with her men. She wouldn't let them think she didn't hold their interest highest in her heart. They had offered their lives. The least she could do was show her appreciation on behalf of the Midlands. Clean, her long hair full and shiny once more, and dressed at last in layers of warm clothes and her mantle, she wound her way among the campfires. She listened with serious attention to the babbling stories of some and the quiet, brief words of others. She spoke with all who had questions, gave smiles of reassurance, and let them all know how proud she was of what they had done. She knelt by the wounded, checking to see if they were warm enough, and laid a hand to their cheeks, giving comfort, and wished them good health and quick healing. She, too, felt relief when they were calmed by her touch. At a fire surrounded by ten silent soldiers, one young man was trembling, but she didn't think it was from the cold. How are you doing? Are you all right? Are you getting warm? Her presence surprised and brightened him. Yes, Mother Confessor. A racking shiver rattled his teeth. I never thought it would be like that. He composed himself and indicated the others. These are my friends. Six didn't come back. She 
She held her mantle closed with one hand and brushed the hair back off his forehead with the other. I'm sorry. I, too, grieve for them. I just wanted you men to know that you made me proud. You were as brave as any soldiers I've ever seen. He chuckled nervously. We'd all be dead if it wasn't for you. We were being driven back, hacked to pieces, and then you charged right into the enemy all by yourself. They all turned their attention to you. And then while they were confused, we counterattacked. What you did saved us. He shook his head. I wish I had killed half as many men tonight as I saw you kill. They all nodded their earnest agreement. He brushed trembling fingers across his face. Thank you, Mother Confessor. If it weren't for what you did, we would all be dead too. He gave her a twitch of a smile. If I had the choice, I'd choose to follow you into battle over Prince Harold himself. Pretty good with a sword, is she? She started at the voice. The soldier turned to see Captain Ryan standing behind her. I think she could teach us swordsmen a thing or two. You wouldn't believe what she... Kalen patted his shoulder. Have you had something to eat? He pointed to the pot of beans on the fire. Would you share some with us, Mother Confessor? She almost lost control of her queasy stomach. You men eat. You need the strength. Thank you for the offer, but I must first see to the others. Captain Ryan followed her away. I had thought you might have some trouble handling a sword. The men who unsaddled your horse told me they found dismembered hands and fingers caught in the girth strap and a few other places. Kalen smiled at men she passed. They lifted a hand or bowed their heads in greeting. Have you forgotten who my father was? He taught me the use of a sword. Mother confessor, that doesn't mean... Lieutenant Sloan was killed. He fell silent a moment. I know, they told me. He put a hand under her arm when she stumbled. You don't look so good. Some of those men who were poisoned look better than you. It's just that I haven't slept for so long. She didn't tell him that she had also used her power again. I'm dead tired. Back outside her shelter, Tosidon offered her a bowl of beans. Her fingers covered her mouth as her eyes winced closed. She thought she might faint at the sight and smell of food. Tosidon seemed to understand and took it away. Prindon put a hand under her other arm. Mother confessor, you must eat, but you need rest even more. She nodded her agreement. I made you some tea. I thought it might be a comfort. He pointed with his chin to the shelter. It is inside. Yes, tea might help settle my stomach. She gave the captain's arm a squeeze. Wake me in the morning when it's time for the next attack. I'll go with the men. If you're rested enough, only if. She cut him off with a look. Yes, Mother Confessor, I'll wake you myself. Inside the cozy shelter, she sipped the hot tea and shook. Her head was spinning. She could only take a few swallows before she fell into the bedroll. She would be better, she told herself, when she was rested. She could feel her power coming to life at last, swelling with its familiar force within her chest. She curled up under her fur mantle, thinking of the thousand things that needed to be tended to. She worried about the men who were at that moment attacking and the ones who would go next. She fretted for them all. They were so young. She worried about what she had started. War. But she hadn't started it. She had only refused to abandon the lives of innocent people to assure death. She'd had no choice. As the mother confessor, she had a responsibility to the people of the Midlands. If the imperial order wasn't stopped, untold thousands would die at their hands, and those who lived would live as slaves to the order. She thought about the young women at the palace in Ebenissia. Their faces floated and spun through her mind's eye. She was too weary to weep for them. When they were avenged, there would be time enough to weep. She seethed with a lust for vengeance. She resolved that she would hound the army of the Imperial Order to their graves. In the morning, she would once more lead her men against the enemy. She would see it through. She would see those girls and all the others avenged. If the Imperial Order wasn't stopped, not only would innocent people be slaughtered, but all magic, good and bad, all the creatures of magic would perish. Richard had magic. Her mind drifted to Richard, and then she did weep, weep in the hope that he would not hate her for what she had done. She prayed that he would be able to understand and forgive her. She had done the best for him to save him, to save the living. Her tears slowed, finally sobbing to a stop. Her thoughts of Richard swept the jumbled, tangled, flashing images from her head. Her mind focused for the first time in days, it seemed, 
on things other than fighting and killing, focused on who she was, who Richard was, focused on important matters floating in the fog at the back of her awareness. Thinking about Richard brought back to her the things that were important, but which she seemed to have forgotten. There were things other than the order that were important, very important. It seemed as if this war had distracted her from higher imperatives, from those important matters. She thought about Dark and Rahl. Dark and Rahl had marked Richard. The Sisters of the Light had taken him. She was supposed to be going to Aidendrill to help Richard, to get Zed to help Richard. Richard had to stop the Keeper. Kaelin frowned in the darkness under her mantle. The veil to the underworld was still torn. She shouldn't be running around swinging a sword at Daharan troops. She remembered Dark and Rahl's laughter. She touched her neck and felt the swollen, broken skin. It had been real. He had laughed at how foolish she was. Kaelin sat up. What was she doing? She had to help stop the Keeper. Shota had said the veil was torn. So had Dark and Rahl and Denna. Kaelin had seen a screeling, a creature straight from the underworld. She had spoken with Denna. Denna had taken Richard's place with the Keeper so that he could live to repair the tear in the veil. Kaelin was supposed to be going to Zed. She shouldn't be running around playing at soldier. But if the Imperial Order wasn't stopped, but if the veil was torn, she had to get to Aidendril. She had to get to Zed. These men could fight a war without her. That was their job. She was the Mother Confessor. She shouldn't be running around foolishly risking her life when the Midlands, the world of the living, was in danger. That was what Dark and Ra was laughing at, her foolishness. She picked up the cup of tea Prindon had made for her and held it in her hands, letting it warm her fingers. She was the leader of the Midlands and had to act like a leader and tend to the most important things above all else, to the things that she and only she could do. She downed the rest of the tea, making a face at the bitter taste. Kaylin lay down again, holding the teacup on her stomach. The faces of the dead women again floated before her eyes. The weapon that most readily conquers reason is terror and violence. That was what the enemy had done to her. The horror of what they had done had conquered her reason. That very day, she and her men could have been lost if the scouts had all been killed. Without those guides, they would have been lost and vincible to the enemy. That was what she was, a guide. She was a guide to the Midlands. She belonged in Aidendrill, guiding the council, pulling everyone together against the threat. Without that guidance, they would be ignorant and lost in the fog of what was happening. She was also Richard's guide for the help he needed. It was up to her to get Zed's help. Without that guidance, Richard and all the living were lost. She sat up, staring into the candle flame. No wonder Dark and Rahl had been laughing at her. She had been letting the enemy conquer her reason. She had almost been diverted from her duties and given the Keeper time to work his plans. She knew now what she had to do. She had done enough to get these men started, had shown them their responsibility and how to carry it out. Now they had the knowledge they needed to conquer the enemy. What she had done was right, but now they had their jobs and she had hers. This army knew what to do now. She had to get to Ada Drill. Having decided, it felt as if a great weight had been lifted from her, but at the same time she felt infused with purpose. Richard, even though he wasn't with her, had helped her find the truth in all the confusion and helped her to see her true duty. She looked in the teacup, but she had drunk the tea and the cup was empty. Her head felt fuzzy. Her eyes wouldn't stay open. She was so tired she could no longer sit up. As she flopped back down, she wondered what Richard was doing, where he was, probably with the sisters, learning how to control the gift. She prayed to the good spirits that they would help him realize how much she loved him. Her arm, suddenly too heavy to hold up, fell to the side, and the cup rolled away. Sleep was as dreamless as death. Chapter 46 She plunged into a void, a wasteland of brutal blackness bereft of all sense of time or awareness of place. She was lost to the world. The dark deprivation was beyond understanding or comfort. Drifting in the depths of that void, she felt something. That there was something to feel sparked hope in her, hope of escape from this forsaken nowhere. With that tingling of sense, she snatched desperately at substance 
as if clutching a rock in a vast, dark river, trying to fight back from the suffocating darkness brought sensation to her body. She floated back, her head throbbing with a dull ache, and numbly she tried to understand what it was that was happening to her. Someone called to her. Mother Confessor, they called. No, that wasn't her name. It came to her. Kaylin. That was her name. Hands shook her. Someone was calling to her and shaking her. She returned from a great distance. Kaylin's eyes opened and the world spun. Captain Ryan was gripping her shoulders, shaking her, calling to her. She drew a deep breath of cold air into her lungs. She twisted her arms away from him, but then had to put her hands back on the ground for support. Concern creased his features. Mother Confessor, are you all right? I... I... She looked about. Tosidon was there, too. She sat up the rest of the way and put her cold fingers to her forehead. My head. What time is it? It will be light soon. With a look of concern, he glanced back over his shoulder at Tosidon. We came to wake you, as you told me to. The swordsmen are ready to go. Kaelin pushed her mantle off. I'll be ready in a moment, and we can... She remembered her decision to get to Aidendrill. She had to get to Zed. She had to get help for Richard. If it was true that the veil was torn. Mother Confessor, you don't look well. You've been through a lot. You hadn't slept in days. And you've only just gotten a few hours of sleep. I think you need more. Yes, she did. Though she could feel that her power was back, she definitely did not feel recovered. She put a hand on his arm. Captain, I must leave for Aidendrill. I must. He gave her a little smile. You rest. You're not rested enough for travel. Stay here and rest. When we get back, you'll be rested and you can leave. She nodded, still clutching his sleeve for support. Yes, and then I must leave. I thought about it last night. I must get to Aidendrill. I'll rest until you get back, but then I must leave. She looked about. Only Tosidon was there with the captain. Where's Chandelin and Prindon? My brother went to check on their sentries to make sure that they didn't place any, Tosidon said, so that our attack will be without warning. Chandelin is attacking with the pikemen, Captain Ryan said. I'm to meet him with the swordsmen for the next attack. Kaelin comforted her sore lip. Tosidon, tell Chandelin that when your attack is finished, we must leave. You three be careful. You must get me to Aidendrill. She could hardly keep her eyes open. She could hardly bring forth the energy to speak. She knew she wasn't able to travel yet. I'll rest until you return. Captain Ryan sighed with relief that she wasn't going with them, that she would be safe here. I'll leave some men to stand guard while you rest. She gestured with her hand. This camp is well hidden. I'm safe up here. He leaned forward insistently. Ten or twelve men are not going to make any difference to us. And I would be better able to put my mind to our task if I'm not worrying about you all alone back here. She didn't have the energy to argue. All right. She flopped back down. With a troubled frown, Tosidon pulled the mantle up over her. She was sinking back into the blackness as the two of them crawled out the opening. She tried to keep herself from going into that unfeeling place, but she was helplessly swept away. The crushing weight of the void closed in around her. She tried to escape its grasp, tried to come back up, but the darkness was too thick, like being encased in mud. She was trapped, still being sucked deeper. She felt a surge of panic. She tried to think, but could not form thoughts into coherent concepts. She had the sense that something was wrong, but could not bring her mind to bear on the solution. This time, instead of surrendering, she focused all her strength on thoughts of Richard, on her need to help him, and the darkness then was not a total void. She had an inkling of time, sensing its incremental passing. She felt as if she were sleeping her whole lifetime away as she tenaciously kept Richard in her thoughts. Her concern for him and her anxiety over the strangeness of the depthless sleep let her slowly, methodically claw her way back. Yet it seemed to take hours. With a desperate gasp, she came awake. Her head swirled with a throbbing ache. Her whole body tingled with sharp little pricks of pain. She laboriously pushed herself up to sit, staring about her dark shelter. The candle was burned almost all the way down. Quiet hummed in her ears. She thought maybe she needed cold air to wake up. Her arms and legs felt thick and heavy as she crawled through the opening of the shelter. 
Outside it was dusk. She looked up at the first stars winking through the trees, her breath fogged before her face as she stood on wobbly legs. Kaylin took a step and promptly tripped over something falling on her face in the snow. Her cheek still against the ground, she opened her eyes. Inches away, glassy eyes were staring at her. The side of a young man's face was lying against the snow close to hers. It was his leg she had tripped over. It felt as if her bones wanted to leap out of her skin and run. His throat was gaping open, his neck nearly sliced in two, letting his head bend back from his body at an impossible angle. She could see the opening of his severed windpipe. Clotted blood covered snow. A bloom of bile rose up into her throat. She swallowed, forcing it back down. Slowly lifting her head, she saw the dark forms of other bodies. They were all Galean. Every sword still rested in its scabbard. They had died without the chance to fight back. Kaylin's legs tensed, wanting to run, but she strained to be still. In the dull fog of the half-sleep she couldn't throw off, she struggled to think. Her mind seemed to be mired in a dreamlike stupor, unable to concentrate. Someone had killed these men and could still be around. She somehow had to force herself to think. She touched her fingers to the dead soldier's hand. It was still warm. This must have just happened. Maybe that was what had wakened her. She peered up among the trees. Men moved in the shadows. They had seen her and were moving into the clearing around her. They laughed and hooted as they came forward, and she saw who they were, close to a dozen Daharans and a couple of Keltons, men of the Imperial Order. With a gasp, Kaelin sprang to her feet. One man, the one closest, had a puffy red wound down the left side of his face from his temple to his jaw where Nick's hoof had caught him. Ragged stitches held the black and red flesh closed. He gave a sneering smile with the good side of his mouth. It was General Riggs. Well, well, I have found you at last, confessor. Kalen flinched with the rest of the men when a dark form screaming a battle cry crashed through the underbrush. As the men turned, Kaylin bolted the other way. Before she turned, she had seen the fading light glint off a huge war axe. The crescent-shaped blade struck down two men in one swing. It was Orsk. He must have been searching for her, too, so he could protect her. One touched by a confessor never gave up. Her legs felt thick and tingled as if she had slept on them, but she ran as hard as she could. Yelling and screaming erupted behind her. Steel rang against steel. Orsk roared as he tore into the men after her. Spruce branches slapped her face as she staggered through the trees. Dead limbs and brush snagged her pants and shirt. Dizzy, she stumbled through the drifts. Snow splashed against her face as she crashed through drooping boughs. She couldn't make her legs run fast enough. The man on her heels grunted as he dove for her. His arms snared her legs and she went down hard. She spit snow out as she kicked and struggled to get away. The man clawed his way up her legs, grabbing hold of her belt and throwing himself on top of her. The red face with the angry wound down one side hovered right over hers. In triumph, he grinned wickedly. Back through the trees, she could hear the sounds of furious battle. She and Riggs were alone as she struggled to squirm away. One fist grabbed her hair and held her head to the ground. The other fist punched her in the side, knocking the wind from her lungs. He hit her again. Nausea swept through her in a hot wave as she fought to get her breath. I've got you now, confessor. You'll not get away again. You may as well resign yourself to it. He was alone. What was he thinking? She slapped a hand to his chest. It seemed a puzzle to her that a lone man would think he could take a confessor. You have no one, Riggs, she managed to say under the weight of him. You've lost. You are mine. I don't think so, he sneered. He said you can't use your power now. He lifted her head and thumped it against the ground. Her vision blurred. She tried to concentrate on what she needed to do. He lifted her head again to bang it against the ground. Though she was bewildered by what he had said, she had to do it now before he knocked her unconscious, before it was too late. Now, when time was hers. Page 483. In the silence of her mind, as he lifted her head, she let her confessor's power sweep through her. She released her restraint. 
There was thunder with no sound. The impact of power of magic made Riggs flinch. Tree branches all around shook with the jolt. Snow dropped down, splattering on his back and her face. His eyes went wide, his jaw slack. Mistress, command me. With the last of her strength, she managed to ask, Who told you my power couldn't harm you? Mistress, it was... The bloody point of an arrow exploded from the prominence on the fore of his throat. The broad steel point stopped a scant inch from her chin. His eyes teared as his mouth moved and blood frothed, but no words came forth. As his breath rattled from his lungs, he began slumping onto her. A fist gripped the shoulder of his uniform and pulled Riggs away. At first, she thought it would be Orsk, but it wasn't. Mother Confessor, a worried Prindon, peered down at her. Are you hurt? Did he hurt you? He hastily rolled the general off her and offered his hand to help her up as his eyes glided down the length of her lying on the snow. She stared up at him, but didn't take his hand. Using her power had left her exhausted and limp as never before. His customary grin spread on his face as he shouldered his bow. I can see you are not hurt. You look very fine. You didn't need to kill him. I had already used my power on him. He was mine. He was just about to tell me who it was that said I could not harm... Her whole body tingled with apprehension at the way his eyes took her in. His familiar grin ran a cold shiver up her arms and the back of her neck, making the fine hair stand stiffly out. Orsk crashed through the trees. Mistress, are you safe? She could hear others coming in the woods behind him. She heard Chandelin's voice. Prindon swiftly knocked an arrow. Orsk lifted his axe with one big fist. Prindon, no! Don't hurt him! Prindon drew his bow. Orsk, run! The big man spun without question and darted back into the brush. An arrow followed him in. She heard the arrow strike something solid. She could hear Orsk stumble through the barren undergrowth, breaking branches and saplings. The snapping of twigs died out, and then she heard him hit the ground. She tried to stand, but feebly fell back. It felt as if she had no bones, and her muscles were melting. Her strength was gone. The blackness was trying to suck her back in. Prindon turned his grin back to her as he shouldered his bow once more. Kalin strained to bring forth the strength to speak. It came in a breathy whisper. Prindon, why did you do that? He shrugged. So we can be alone, his smile widened, before they chop off your head. Prindon. Prindon had told Riggs her power wouldn't hurt him, so she would expend it on him and would have nothing left. Her legs trembled with the effort of trying to lift herself. She fell back again as he watched. A voice came through the trees. It was a breathless Chandelin calling to her. In another direction, she heard Tosidin calling. She tried to scream to them. Only a weak, hoarse complaint came from her throat. Darkness pressed into her. Maybe she was still asleep, she thought. She could hardly speak, hardly move, just like a nightmare. She wished it were, but she knew it was no dream. Prindon turned to the insistent calls. Kaylin dug her heels into the snow and with a mighty effort managed to scoot herself back. Her hand fell on a stout maple limb lying on the ground. Prindon rushed to her. She focused all her fear, her dread, her pain and horror at what was happening into action. It took everything she had. Prindon reached for her. Kaylin came up swinging the stout limb. Prindon ducked and snatched her would-be club, wrenching it from her grip. He spun her to him and curled his arm around her head over her mouth as she tried to warn Chandelin. Though he wasn't big, she knew Prindon to be incredibly strong, but in her present state, even a child could have had his way with her. Chandelin ran up behind them, a knife in hand. Kaylin bit into Prindon's arm. She cried out as Prindon spun with impossible speed and strength, catching Chandelin across the side of the head with a branch. The sound of the hollow thunk was sickening. The blow knocked Chandelin into the boughs of a fir tree. As she twisted from Prindon's grip, she saw blood on the snow around Chandelin. Tosidon, breathing hard, burst through the trees. What is happening? Prindon! He saw them and stopped in his tracks. He looked to Chandelin and then to Prindon. Prindon peered back over his shoulder at his brother, speaking in his own tongue. Chandelin tried to kill us. I came here just as he tried to kill the mother confessor. Help me. She is hurt. Kalin collapsed to her knees, crying out. No! Tosidon, no! Tosidon ran toward them. What is this trouble Chandelin told me of? What is wrong with you, brother? What have you done? Help me. 
The mother confessor has been hurt. Tosidon gripped his brother's shoulder and spun him around. Prendon, what have you... Prendon slammed a knife into his brother's chest. Tosidon's eyes went wide in surprise. His mouth opened, but no words came. With a wheeze, his legs buckled and he crumpled to the ground. Kalin cried out. He had been stabbed through the heart. Chondolin sat up with a groggy groan. He put his hands to his bleeding scalp. Keeping an eye to the wounded man, Prindon pulled a bone box from his waist pouch. He had a full box of bandu. He hadn't given her all his poison. Helpless to stop him, Kalin saw Prindon wipe a generous gob of poison onto the arrow's point. Dazed, Chondolin held his head in his hands as he tried to gather his wits. Prindon drew the bowstring to his cheek. She knew he was aiming for Chondolin's throat. Just as Prindon released the arrow, she managed to throw herself against his legs, making the arrow go astray from its target. It still hit Chondolin in the shoulder. The back of his fist across her face sent her sprawling. Powered by sheer terror, Kaylin started scrambling away on her hands and knees. The snow was freezing her fingers. The knees of her pants were soaked and icy wet. She concentrated on the cold to try to revive herself. She glanced over her shoulder as she clambered away. Prendon drew another arrow from his quiver and wiped it in the poison as he watched her struggle. As he had watched Chandelin, a cry came from her throat as she staggered to her feet and ran. A nightmare. It had to be a nightmare. The arrow felt like a club hitting the back of her left leg. She screamed and fell to her face. Her leg flamed in hot pain. A tingling, prickling sensation spread through the muscle. The pain seared through the bone into her hip. Prindon was suddenly over her. He knelt down and gripped the arrow sticking from the back of her leg. He put his other hand against her bottom to hold her and yanked the arrow free. Kalin could feel the tingle of the poison going up her leg. Don't worry, Mother Confessor. I did not use much poison on your arrow like on Chandelin's. Just enough to make sure you will give me no trouble. He will be dead in another minute. You will live long enough to have your head chopped off. His hand stroked her bottom. If they do not wait too long. Prindon leaned over her. It is too cold out here. We will go back. He took hold of her wrist and started dragging her across the snow. In her mind, Kaylin fought him. She struggled. She shrieked. She hit. But she couldn't make her body obey. She was as limp as a rag doll being dragged over the snow. She could feel the poison spreading to her ribs. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Orsk, Tosidon, Chandelin. Her. How could Prindon do such a thing? She sobbed as her face slid over the snow. How could he? His own brother. He had stabbed his own brother as if it meant nothing. Who could do such a thing? How could anyone do such a thing? How could anyone but a... Baneling. She gasped with the realization. She had never fully believed in Banelings before. Wizards had told her they were real, but she never believed the wizards knew for sure. She had always thought it might be superstitious nonsense that sent people hunting things in the dark, things from the underworld, things bidden from the Keeper's own dark whispers. But now she knew. She was in the grips of a baneling. Dear spirits, how could no one know? He had helped her so many times. He had befriended her. So he could be close to her and keep track of her for the Keeper. He was a baneling. Dark and Rahl had laughed at her because she was so stupid. She knew now without a doubt. The veil was torn. Dark and Rahl had promised her such things. He had come to tear the veil the rest of the way, and she had foolishly thought she was in control of what she was doing. But all the time, Dark and Rahl and the Keeper had watched her through Prindon's eyes. But why wait until now? Why let her fight in this war, let all these people die before he snatched her? Kayla knew why. The Keeper was of the world of the dead. Bringing death to the world of the living was what he wanted. He resented the living. That was why he wanted the veil torn, so he could bring death to the world of the living. He coveted this world's breath of life. He enjoyed watching people die. He did not wish to stop it too soon, stop the suffering, the fear, the pain. It felt as if her arm might tear from its socket as Prindon tugged her through the brush and over a log half covered over with snow. The tingling of the poison had spread across her chest. Her left leg had gone numb. At least she thought she couldn't feel how much the arrow wound hurt. The round iron point had hit the bone, and Prindon had not been gentle about pulling it out. At least it was numb now. 
When they reached the shelter, she could see bodies all about, not only the Galean men, but the men of the Imperial Order that Orsk had killed. Soon, when Prindon was finished with her, he would turn her over to the army of the Order and she would be beheaded. It would be over and there was nothing she could do to stop it. She couldn't even fight back. She would never see Richard again. Dear spirits, he would never know how much she loved him. Prindon dragged her through the opening to the shelter and heaved her onto the mat of boughs. As he lit two more candles from the one that was almost burned down, she struggled to breathe, to remain conscious. I wish to be able to see you, he explained with a lecherous smile. You are very fine to look upon. I wish to see all of you. She had always liked his smile. She didn't like it now. Prindon took off his fur mantle and tossed it aside. His smile vanished. His eyes were wild. He didn't speak in her tongue anymore, but only his own. Take off your clothes. I wish to look upon you first, to be aroused by the sight of you. Even if he had held a knife to her throat, she wouldn't have been able to obey. She couldn't move her arms. Prindon, she managed to whisper. The man will be back soon. They will catch you here. They will be busy. They are having a fight like they never expected. His smile returned. They will not be back soon, if at all. The smile changed in an instant to a twisted expression of hot rage. I said take off your clothes. Prindon, you are my friend. Please don't do this. He crawled on top of her, yanking at her belt. Then I will do it for you. Tears over her helplessness, over the loss of a friend to this madness, to the keeper, ran down her cheeks. Prindon, why? He sat up as if surprised by the question. The great spirit said I may have you before he takes your spirit to the underworld. He said I am to have a reward for the work I have done. The great spirit is pleased with me for delivering you to him. The bite on her neck stung with prickling pain. She shivered with sorrow for Tosidon and Chandelin. She shivered at her own desolate, hopeless situation. The tingling from the poison had spread across her shoulders. She could feel the slight twinge of its first touch moving up her throat. He squeezed her under him as he kissed the place on her neck where Dark and Raoul's lips had been, where the bite was. The pain, the visions, sent a silent shriek through her. Brendan, please, after you have me, let me go. She hoped that hearing her words in his tongue would mean more to him. Please? He lifted his head away, looking into her eyes. It would do no good for me to leave you. You have been poisoned by the tea and by the arrow. You will die soon anyway. You must be beheaded before you die of the poison. It will be better. You will not suffer the poison's end. That is my mercy to you. Prindon grinned as he started to bend over her again, kissing her neck. Tears ran down her cheeks. I hate you, she wept. You and your great spirit. He sprang up standing as best he could in the small shelter, with his fists at his sides as he glared down at her. You are to be mine. I have been promised. I will have you. Your power cannot harm me. I saw to that. It is used up for now. You are to be mine. If you will not give yourself to me, I will take you. You brought your hateful magic to my people, your hateful ways. You are evil, and I will take you to conquer your wickedness. The great spirit has said it shall be so. Prindon pulled his buckskin shirt off over his head, off his wiry frame. He leapt full onto her, landing with a grunt. His face was right above hers. They stared at each other in surprise. He had no idea what had happened. She knew what had happened, but had no idea how. She could feel his warm blood flowing over her fist. His pupils expanded. He coughed, splattering little droplets of blood across her face. With a long, slow gurgle, he went limp as his last breath left his lungs. Tears ran down Kalin's face. She didn't have the strength to push him off her. She could hardly breathe under his weight. And so she lay still, feeling his blood drain over her hand between her breasts and soak into her shirt. The tingling of the poison had risen up her neck. Chapter 47 In the tingling blackness, her lip hurt. Something was jabbing against the cut, making it throb. Something was in her mouth. She thought it felt like a finger poking into her mouth. Swallow! 
Kalin frowned in the darkness in her sleep. Swallow, do you hear me? Swallow! Making a sour face, she did as commanded. The finger pushed more of the dry things into her mouth. Swallow again! She swallowed, hoping the voice would leave her alone now. It did. She sank back down into the tingling void. She drifted in the nowhere place, unaware. She had no concept of time, no idea how long she floated. With a gasp, her eyes opened. She blinked around at her shelter. The candles were burned halfway down. Her fur mantle was covering her. Chandelin leaned over, peering down at her. A broad smile spread on his lips. He let out a long sigh of relief. You are back, he said. You are safe now. Chandelin? She tried to make sense of what she was seeing. Am I in the underworld, or are you not dead? He laughed quietly. Chandelin is hard to kill. She worked her tongue, trying to wet her dry mouth. She was awake, really awake for the first time in as long as she could remember. It seemed she had forgotten what it was like to be awake, how vibrant it felt. Still, she did not move, afraid the blackness would return. But Prindon shot you with a ten-step arrow. I saw it. He turned a bit, looking away in chagrin. She could see that his black hair was matted with dried blood. He flipped his hand, as if uneasy that he had to explain. Remember I told you that our ancestors took Kwasindo before they went into battle? so that if they were shot with a ten-step arrow, the poison would not kill them? She nodded. He tenderly tested his wounded scalp. Well, in honor of my ancestors, my warrior ancestors, I ate some of the Kwasindo leaves before I went to fight. The Kwasindo you gave to me back at that city. His eyebrows lifted, as if further justification was needed. It was to honor my ancestors. Kalin smiled warmly to him as she put a hand to his arm. You have done your ancestors proud. He helped her sit up. In the dim light, she saw that Prindon lay next to her on his back. The bone knife, the bone knife made from Chandelin's grandfather's bones, the one she had worn at her arm, jutted from Prindon's chest. The black feathers fanned out around the hilt end, draped like a shroud over the fatal wound. Somehow, she had managed to put that knife between them when Prindon had leaped on her. Somehow. She remembered her numb, helpless plight. She remembered the tingling feeling of the poison and that she couldn't move. She remembered her terror. She remembered Prindon's leap onto her. But she didn't remember pulling the knife. Her voice trembled. I'm so sorry, Chandelin. Her fingers covered her mouth. I'm so sorry that I killed your friend. Chandelin glared at the body. He was not my friend. My friends do not try to kill me. He put a comforting hand to her shoulder. He was sent by the great dark spirit of the dead. His heart was taken by evil. Kalin clutched his sleeve. Chandelin, that great dark spirit of the dead is trying to escape from behind the veil. He wants to pull us all behind the veil into the world of the dead. His brown eyes studied hers. I believe you. We must get you to Aidendril so you may help stop him. She sagged with relief. Thank you, Chandelin. Thank you for understanding and for saving me with the Kwasindo. Kalin clutched his arm. The men! Prindon set a trap for them. What time is it? He made a comforting hushing sound. When Captain Ryan came to Tosidon and me before the attack, I asked where you were. I knew you would want to be with them. He told me that you were sick, that you could not wake. It sounded to me like Bandu. Captain Ryan said you would not eat and would have only tea Prindon made for you. I knew then what was happening. I knew you had been poisoned, and the only thing you had was tea. Tosidon and I were greatly worried for you. We checked to see if the enemy had changed position. We saw that they were waiting for the attack where we had planned it at first. I made the men change the attack and come from a different place than expected. As soon as I gave the new orders, we rushed back here. I knew Prindon had betrayed us, but Tosidon thought there must be some other explanation. He trusted his brother and did not want to think evil of him. He paid for his trust, his mistake, with his life. Kalin looked away in the uneasy quiet. She frowned back at him. What of the arrow? What of the wound on your head? We must see to your wounds. Chandelin pulled the neck of his buckskin shirt to the side, revealing a bandage over his left shoulder. The man returned in the night. They stitched my head. It is not as bad as it looks. They also took out the arrow. 
He winced as he pulled the shirt back up on his shoulder. I taught Prindon well. He used a bladed arrow. Bladed arrows do more harm coming out than going in. One of the men, the one who cuts and sews the wounded, cut out the arrow and stitched me together. The arrow hit the bone, so it did not go in too far. My arm is stiff, and I will not be able to use it for a time. Kalin felt her leg. There was a bandage under her pants. Did he stitch my leg, too? No. It did not need sewing, just to be wrapped. I did that. Prindon used a round point on you. That is not like I taught him. I don't know why he would do that. Kalin could feel the presence of the body next to her. He wanted to be able to get it out of me after he shot me with poison, she said quietly. He wanted it out of his way. He was going to rape me before he gave me to the enemy. Chandelin watched the body, not wanting to look at her, and said he was glad that had not happened. She touched his left hand. And I'm glad it was your shoulder and not your throat. He frowned. I taught Frendon how to shoot. He would never miss my throat from that distance. Why did he not shoot my throat? She shrugged, feigning ignorance. He grunted suspiciously. Chandelin, why is his body still in here? Why didn't you drag him out? He moved his wounded arm a bit with his other, making it more comfortable. Because Grandfather's spirit knife is still in him, he regarded her with a serious expression. You have used the aid of Grandfather's bones, his spirit, to protect yourself, to take another life. Grandfather's spirit is bonded to you now. No other may touch his bone knife now. It is yours, and only you may touch it. You must remove it. Kalin momentarily contemplated whether or not she could just leave the knife where it was and bury it with the body. She thought maybe the bone knife should be put to rest, too. But she discarded the thought. To the mud people, this was powerful spirit magic. She would insult Chandelin if she rejected the knife. She thought, too, that maybe she would be insulting the spirit of Chandelin's grandfather if she didn't take back the knife. She wasn't entirely sure that it wasn't the spirit in the bone knife that had killed Prindon to save her. She didn't know how the knife had gotten into her hand. Kaylin reached out and wrapped her fingers around the round end protruding from Prindon's chest. It made a sucking sound as she pulled it from the body. She wiped it clean on the balsam boughs covering the floor. Kaylin brought the round end to her lips and kissed it lightly. Thank you, spirit grandfather, for saving my life. Somehow it seemed the right thing to do. Chandelin smiled as she slid the bone knife into the band on her arm. You are a good mud person. You knew what to do without me telling you. Grandfather's spirit will watch over you always. Chandelin, we must get to Aidendril. The veil to the underworld is torn. We've done what we must to help these men. I must do my job now. When we first found these men, I did not want to stay with them. I wanted to be away from their fight so that you would be safe. He stared off at nothing. Somehow I forgot that thought, and all I wanted to do was fight and kill the enemy. I know, she whispered. That happened to me, too. I forgot all about what I was supposed to be doing. It's almost as if we, too, listened to the great dark spirit. The veil is torn. Maybe that's why we were distracted. You think that this veil is torn, and because of that we forgot what we were to do and wanted only to kill? Chandelin, I don't know the answers to these things. I must get to Aidendril. The wizard will know what to do. Richard needs help. We have taken enough time here. We must not waste any more. We must talk to the men and then be on our way. Are they out there? He nodded. Then let's get going. She started to rise, but he put his good hand to her arm and stopped her. They have been waiting outside your shelter all night. I would not let them come inside. He took his hand back as he seemed to search for the right words. I feared greatly that you would die this night. I didn't know if I had given you the Quasindo in time. Prindon had been giving you poison without our knowing it for a long time. You almost went to the spirit world. If you had died, I would never be able to return to my people again. But that is not why I am glad you live. I am glad because you are a good mud person. You are a protector to our people the same as Chandelin. We each fight in our own way. He lifted an eyebrow. Lately, you have been fighting too much like Chandelin fights. You are good at it, but you should leave that to me and fight in the way you are meant to fight. Kalin smiled. You're right. Thank you for sitting with me all night. It was good to have you near. I'm sorry you were hurt. He shrugged. Someday, when I find a woman for myself, I will have scars to show her, so she may see how brave Chandelin is. Kalin laughed. 
I'm sure she will be impressed with your bravery when you were shot with an arrow. Chondolin gave her a crooked look. It does not prove I was brave because I was shot with an arrow. Anyone can be shot. He lifted his chin. I am brave because I did not cry out when the arrow was cut from me. Someday, Kalin thought, some fortunate woman would have her hands full with this one. I'm glad the good spirits watched over you, and you are with me. He narrowed his eyes as he peered at her. I do not know what happened, but I think Prindon missed my throat because you were watching over me, too. She only grinned. When she looked to the body, her grin withered. She stroked the fur of her mantle. Poor Tosidon. He loved his brother. I'll miss him. Chondolin glanced to the body. I have known them since they were young boys. They both followed me around, begging me to teach them, begging to be one of my men. He hung his head in silence. Finally, he returned his attention to her. The men are worried greatly about you. They are waiting. Kalin followed as he crawled out on his knees in one hand. She dragged the sword with her. Outside in the light, there was a sudden rustle of sound as men rose to their feet. Captain Ryan rushed forward, but a big man with one arm in a sling thrust his good arm across the captain's chest, stopping him cold. He held a monstrous war axe in his fist. Orsk, you are alive too? His eyes were red from weeping. Kalin remembered the way her father had wept when her mother, his mistress, was ill. Mistress, tears sprang anew to his eyes. You are well. What do you wish? Orsk, these men are all my friends. None of them will hurt me. You do not need to keep them away. I'm safe. It would please me if you just sat quietly for now. Instantly, he flopped to the ground. Kalin gave a questioning frown to Chondolin. Chondolin shrugged. I saw him fight to protect you, and Brendan wanted to kill him. So I gave him Kwasin Do. The men dug the arrow from his back. I am not sure how badly he is hurt. He has no interest in his wound, only in you. I was only able to keep him out of the shelter by telling him you needed to be left alone or you might not recover. But he would not leave this spot as long as you are inside. Kaylin sighed as she gazed at the grisly face staring silently up at her. She could hardly stand to look at the jagged white scar and the one eye that was sewn shut. She returned her attention to an impatient Captain Ryan and the hundreds of faces behind him. How goes the war? The war? Dash the war, are you all right? You had us scared to death. He cast a hot glance at Chondolin and then at Orsk sitting in the snow. These two wouldn't even let me have a peek at you to see how you were. That's their job, Kalin said. She gave them a warm smile. Thank you all for your concern. Chondolin has saved me. Well, what happened? This place was a mess. The dozen men I left here were slaughtered by a troga. Prindon and Tosidon are dead, and there were dead men of the order. We feared they killed you. Kalin realized Chondolin had told them nothing. One of the dead men, off in that direction, is General Riggs of the Imperial Order. Orsk here, she pointed down to the one-eyed man, killed most of the men of the Order. They came here to get me. Prindon killed our guards and his brother, and he tried to kill me. Whispers and gasps spread among the men. Captain Ryan's eyes looked like they would pop from his head. Prendon! Not Prendon! Dear spirits, why? She waited until silence settled over the men. She spoke in a quiet tone. Prendon was a baneling. Stunned silence was all she heard for a moment. And then the worried whispers of baneling spread back through the ranks. You men are doing a fine job, but now you must fight on without me. I must get to Aidendrill. Disappointed murmurs filled the air. I would not leave you if I did not know you were up to the task. You have all proven your worth and your heart in battle. You are men the equal of any. The men stood a little taller. They listened intently to her, as if hearing their general. I am proud of each and every one of you. You are heroes of the Midlands. This army of the Imperial Order, threat though it is, is representative of a larger threat to the Midlands, to the world of the living. That the Keeper would send a baneling to stop me is proof of that. I believe the Imperial Order is aligned with the Keeper. I must now turn my attention to this threat. I know you will fight on as you have sworn and show the enemy no quarter. I know the days of the Order are numbered. Kalin realized that her neck didn't hurt. She touched her fingers to the bite. It was gone. Suddenly she felt that perhaps she had escaped the Keeper's grasp in more ways than one. 
With a serious demeanor, she regarded the young faces that intently watched her. Though you will fight on without quarter, you must not let yourselves become what you are fighting. The enemy fights to kill and to enslave. You fight for life and freedom. Keep that always uppermost in your hearts. Do not let yourselves become what you hate. I know how easy it is to do. It almost happened to me. Kalin put a fist into the air. I promise to never forget a one of you. Promise me that when this is finished, both the threat from the Imperial Order and the threat from the Keeper, that you will one day all come to aid and drill, so the Midlands may honor your sacrifice. The men all lifted a fist in pledge. A cheer went up. Captain Ryan, please tell the men at the other camps my words. I wish I could speak to them all myself, but I must leave at once. He assured her it would be done. Kalin lifted the sword in both hands, holding it out. King Wiborn wielded this sword in battle to protect his land. The mother confessor has wielded it in defense of the Midlands. I now place it in capable hands. Captain Ryan's fingers carefully lifted the sword from hers. He held it as if holding the crown of Galea itself. A beaming grin lit his face. I will carry it with pride, Mother Confessor. Thank you for everything you have taught us. When you first found us, we were boys. Thank you for making us into men. You have taught us not only to fight better, but more importantly, what it means to be soldiers and to be protectors of the Midlands. He took the hilt in his fist and held the sword skyward as he turned to his men. Three cheers for the Mother Confessor! As she listened to the three wild cheers, Kaylin realized that in all her life she had never heard anyone cheer the Mother Confessor before. She had to strain to keep her surprise from showing. She lifted a kiss on her fingers and thanked them all. Captain Ryan, I wish to take Nick, and I will need two other horses also. Chondolin lurched forward. Now, why do you need horses? She lifted an eyebrow to him. Chondolin, I have an arrow wound in my leg. I can hardly stand, much less walk. I need to ride if I'm to get to Aidendrill. I hope you do not think me weak because of it. His brow knotted up. Well, no, of course you cannot be expected to walk. His eyes turned angry again. But why do you want two other horses? If I ride, you must too. Chondolin does not need to ride. I am strong. She leaned close and spoke in his tongue. Chondolin, I know the mud people do not ride horses. I would not expect you would know how. I will teach you. You will do fine. When you return to your people, you will have a new skill that none of them have. They will be impressed. The women will see that you are brave. He grunted suspiciously as he scowled. Then why do we need the third horse? We are taking Orsk. What? Kalin shrugged. You can't draw a bow until your arm recovers. How will you protect me? Orsk can wield an axe with his one good arm, and you can throw a spear with yours. He rolled his eyes. I am not going to be able to talk you out of this, am I? No, she said with a small smile. Now, we better get our things and be on our way. Kalin surveyed the men one last time. Her men. She gave them a salute of her fist to her heart. They all silently returned the salute. She had lost much with these men. She had gained much. Take care, each and every one of you. Chapter 48 So, when are we going to meet your people? The ones who will guide Sister Verna and me to the palace. Du Shailu glanced back over her shoulder, pulling her mass of black hair out of the way to peer at him. She was leading her horse. Richard had grown tired of her complaints, and when she finally refused to ride any longer, he decided not to make an issue of it and let her walk. Richard had decided to walk for a while himself. Sister Verna rode behind them, watching Du Shailu like an owl from atop her horse. Soon. Her cool, distant expression disturbed him. Very soon. Her attitude had slowly changed since they had left the Magendi land as they went deeper into hers. She was no longer chatty and open, but had grown haughty and distant. Sister Verna rarely took her eyes from Du Shailu, and Du Shailu, in turn, didn't miss a move the sister made. They were like two cats with their fur standing on end, silent and still, but ready to spring. It wouldn't have surprised him if soon he saw their teeth bared. Richard had the feeling the two of them were constantly testing each other, but in ways he couldn't see. By the sister's attitude, he didn't think she was pleased about what she was discovering. Richard could tell from experience when the sister was touching her Han, he recognized the shroud of it in her eyes. She was touching it now. 
In the gathering darkness, Du Shailu turned abruptly from the wide forest trail, leading them on a narrow path through the thick, tangled growth. Dark water holding dense thickets of reeds and broad-leafed plants with pink and yellow trumpet-shaped flowers lurked to the sides. Richard's eyes scanned the shadows among the trees. Du Shailu came to a halt at the edge of a sandy open area. She lifted the reins of her horse to Richard. The others will join us in this place. Wait here, magic man. The term she used to address him lifted his hackles. He took the reins. Richard. My name is Richard. I'm the one who saved your neck, remember? Du Shailu looked at him thoughtfully. Please don't ever think I do not appreciate what you have done for me, for my people. Your kindness will always be in my heart. Her eyes seemed to go out of focus, and her voice softened with regret. But you are still a magic man. Her back straightened. Wait here. She turned and disappeared into the forest around the clearing. Richard stood watching her vanish as Sister Verna dismounted. She took the reins to all three horses. She is going to try to kill you now, she said, as if telling him that she thought it would rain tomorrow. Richard glared at her. I saved her life. Sister Verna started leading the horses to the trees. You are a magic man to these people. They kill magic men. Richard didn't want to believe her, but he did. Then use your Han to prevent it, sister. To preserve life, as you told Du Shai Lu she should do with her new child. Sister Verna stroked her horse's chin. She has use of her Han, too. That's why the sisters have always avoided these people. Some of them can use their Han, but in a way we don't understand. I've tried little things on her to test her. The spells I send at her disappear like pebbles dropped down a well, and they do not go unnoticed. Du Shai Lu knows what I try to do, and somehow is able to annul it. I told you before, these people are dangerous. I have fought every step of the way to prevent this. I warned you not to swing the axe. You saw my efforts as misguided. Richard gritted his teeth. His left hand gripped the hilt of the sword. He could feel the bumps of the word truth woven into the wire, and through it the heat of its rage. I have no intention of killing anyone. Good. Keep the anger of the sword out. You are going to need it if you're to survive. They are surrounding us as we speak. That much my Han can tell me. Richard felt as if things were suddenly spinning out of his control. He didn't want to hurt anyone. He hadn't saved Du Shai Lu just to have to fight her people. Then I suggest you call on your Han, Sister Verna. I am the seeker, not an assassin. I'm not going to kill your enemies for you. She took a few strides toward him. Her voice was tight and controlled. I told you, my Han is not going to be able to help. I would end the threat if I could, but I can't. Du Shai Lu has power against magic. I'm begging you, Richard, defend yourself. His eyes narrowed. Perhaps you just don't want to help. You're angry that I spoiled the arrangement the sisters had with the Majendi. You plan on watching like you always do just to see what I'll do. She slowly shook her head in frustration. Do you really think, Richard, that I would spend half my life in my duty to find you and carry you safely to the Palace of the Prophets, only to watch you killed when we're on the doorstep of my home? Do you actually believe that I wouldn't stop this if I could? Is your opinion of me that low? His impulse was to argue with her, but instead he considered her words. What she said made sense. Richard gave an apologetic shake of his head, then quickly glanced into the shadows. How many are there? Perhaps thirty. Thirty. In frustration, he folded his arms. How am I to defend against thirty by myself? She looked out into the darkness a moment, then cast her hands forward. A wind rose, carrying a veil of sand and dirt outward into the blackness. That will slow them for a short time, but not stop them. She turned her brown eyes on him once more. Richard, I have used my Han to seek an answer. The only thing my Han tells me is that you must use the prophecy to survive. You've named yourself the bringer of death as the prophecy foretells. The prophecy is about you. You must use the prophecy if you are to defeat that many. The prophecy says the holder of the sword is able to call the dead forth, call the past into the present. Somehow that's what you must do in order to survive. Call forth the dead. Call the past into the present. Richard unfolded his arms. We're about to be overrun by 30 people you say are going to try to kill me and you give me riddles? Sister, I told you before that I don't know what it means. If you want to help, then tell me something I can use. She turned away, walking back toward the horses. 
I have. Sometimes prophecies are meant to give aid to the one named by sending help across time, providing a key that may open a door to enlightenment. I believe this prophecy is such. This prophecy is about you. You must find its use. I don't know its meaning. She stopped and turned to look back over her shoulder. You forget. I tried to keep us out of the hands of these people. You said that in this matter you were not my student, but the seeker. As the seeker, you must use this prophecy. You are the one who got us into this. Only you can get us out. Richard stared after her as she gentled the nervous animals. He had thought about this prophecy before, wondering, ever since she had told it to him, what it could mean. Sometimes he had felt as if he was on the verge of insight, but the feeling always slipped away from him before coming to fruition. He had used the sword many times and knew its capabilities. He also knew his own limitations. Against one, the sword was virtually invincible, but he was flesh and blood. He was no expert swordsman. In the past, he had always depended on the sword's magic to make the difference. But he was only one man, and they were many. The sword could only be in one place at one time. Are they good fighters, he asked. The Baka Ban Mana are without peer. They have special fighters, blade masters, who train from sunup to sundown every day. And then they train by the light of the moon. Fighting is almost a religion to them. When I was young... I saw a Bakabanmana blade master who had gotten into the garrison in Tanamura kill nearly 50 well-armed soldiers before he was taken down. They fight like they are invincible spirits. Some people believe they are. That's just great, he said under his breath. Richard, she said without looking to him, I know we don't get along. We could look at the same thing and each see something different. We're from different worlds. Both of us are headstrong and neither of us likes the other very much but I want you to know that I'm not trying to be obstinate about this. You spoke the truth in that this is about you as the seeker, not as my student. In a way I don't understand, it's also bundled up with prophecy. You are riding a ripple in events. I am but a bystander in this. If you die, however, I die too. She at last lifted her eyes to his. I don't know how to help you, Richard. There are people closing around us to watch what will happen, and I know that if I try to interfere, I will be killed by them. This is about prophecy. You and the Bakaban Mana. I play no part in it other than to die if you do. I don't know what the prophecy means, and I realize you don't either, but keep it in mind, and maybe its use will come as you need it. Try to use your Han if you can. Richard stood with his hands on his hips. All right, sister, I'll try. I'm just sorry I'm no good at riddles. And if I'm killed, well, thank you for trying to help me. He looked up at the sky at the thin veil of clouds that dimmed the moon. The darkness helped hide those who came. There was no reason it couldn't be used to his advantage, too. Richard was a woods guide, at home in the darkness of the woods. He had spent countless hours at games like this with other guides. This was his element, too, not just theirs. He didn't have to do it their way. Crouching, he moved off away from the sister and their horses and became one with the moon shadows. He found the first of them looking the wrong way. Still and silent, he watched the dark form wrapped in loose clothes, squatted on one knee, watching the sister. Clutched tightly in one fist was a short spear, its butt planted in the sand. Two more spears lay on the ground. Richard concentrated on controlling his breathing to keep from making a sound as he glided closer. Moving, stopping, moving again, he approached ever closer. His hand reached out. Inches from the spear, he froze as the head turned. The figure sprang up, but Richard was close enough. He snatched the spear away. As the man whirled, Richard spun the spear and whacked him across the side of the head. He went down before he had a chance to raise an alarm. One down, Richard thought, as he straightened, and without having to kill him. At least he hoped he hadn't killed him. Slipping out of the darkness, a figure appeared. To the side, another, and then another. Richard turned about and saw more appearing. Before he could move away, he was surrounded. The forms were wrapped in bark-colored, loose clothes so that they would blend in with the surrounding country. Cloth wound around their heads, hid all but their dark eyes, which shined with grim determination. There was nowhere to run. Richard sidestepped into the clearing as the circle of forms moved with him. More were closing in all about. Richard turned, watching them as they formed two rings around him. Maybe he could still do this without killing. Who speaks for you? The inner ring of robed figures dropped their round shields and cast their extra spears to the ground, points toward Richard. 
each clasped their remaining spear in two hands like a staff. Their eyes never left him. The outer ring of warriors cast their shields and all their spears to the ground and put their hands to their sword hilts, but didn't draw them. A soft rhythmic chant began, and the two circles slowly began moving in opposite directions. Richard walked backward in a tight circle, trying to keep watch on all of them. Who speaks for you? The slow chant continued in time with their sideways steps. A figure wrapped from head to foot like the others rose up on a rock beyond the outer circle. I am Du Shai Lu. I speak for the Bakaban Mana. Richard could hardly believe this was happening. Du Shai Lu, I saved your life. Why would you want to murder us? The Bakaban Mana are not here to murder you. We are here to execute you for stealing our sacred lands. Du Shai Lu, I've never even seen your land before. I had nothing to do with whatever happened. Magic men took our lands from us. They laid down our laws. You are a magic man. You bear the sins of those magic men before you. You even bear their mark to prove it. You must do as all before, who we could catch. You must face the circle. You must die. Du Shai Lu, I told you the killing must stop. It is easy to proclaim the killing must end when you are the one about to die. How dare you say that to me? I risked my life to stop the killing. I risked my life for you. She spoke softly. I know, Richard. For that I will always honor you. I would have borne your sons had you asked it of me. I would lay my life down for you. For what you have done, you will live on as a hero to my people. I will tie a prayer to my address that the spirits take you tenderly to their hearts. But you are a magic man. The old law says that we must practice every day and be better with a blade than any other people born. We have been told that we must kill every magic man we can catch, or the spirit of the dark will take the world of life into the dark. You can't go on killing magic men or anyone else. It must stop. The killing cannot end because of what you have done. It can only end when the spirits dance with us. What does that mean? It means we must kill you, or what has been spoken will be brought to pass. The dark spirit will escape his prison. Richard pointed with the spear. Du Shilu, I don't want to kill any of you, but I will defend myself. Please stop now before anyone else is hurt. Don't make me kill any of you, please. Had you tried to run, we would have put spears in your back, but since you choose to stand, you have earned the right to face us. You will die anyway, as have all before whom we have caught. If you do not fight us, it will be made quick and you will not suffer. You have my word. She turned her hand in the air, and the chanting started again. The outer ring of men drew their swords, long, black-handled weapons, each with a ring at the pommel holding a cord that looped around the swordsman's neck to keep the sword from being lost in battle. Each blade was curved, widening toward the clipped point. The men spun the swords, passing them from right hand to left and back again. The blades never stopped spinning. The two rings began moving in opposite directions again. The inner circle of men began twirling the spears like staffs. Richard had known guides who carried staffs. No one ever bothered a guide with a staff. These people were better than any guide he had ever seen. The shafts of wood were a blur in the moonlight, the steel points a circle of dull reflection. Richard broke the spear shaft over his knee and drew his sword. The sound of steel rang above the sound of the whistling spears and blades. Don't do this, Du Shailu. Stop it now before anyone else is hurt. Do not fight us, witch man, and we will grant you a quick death. I owe you at least that. Richard's chest heaved. The muscles in his jaw flexed as he gritted his teeth. The chanting increased in speed and the circles of men moved faster. Richard glared at Du Shai Lu as she stood on the rock. I disavow responsibility for what is to happen, Du Shai Lu. It is you who presses this. What happens is your responsibility. You bring it. She spoke softly, her voice filled with regret. We are many, you are but one. I am sorry, Richard. Only a fool would have confidence in those odds, Du Shai Lu. They are not what they seem. You cannot all come at me at once. You can only attack one or two, or at most three at a time. The odds are not what they seem to your eyes. Richard wondered dimly where his own words had come from. He could see her nod in the moonlight. You understand the dance of death, witch man. I'm not a witch man, Du Shai Lu. I am Richard, the seeker of truth. I'm not going with this sister to learn to be a witch man by choice. I'm a prisoner. You know that. But I will defend myself. Du Shailu watched him in the moonlight. 
The spirits know I am sorry for you, Seeker Richard, but you must die. Don't be sorry for me, Du Shailu. Be sorry for those of you who are going to die this night for no good reason. You have not seen the Bakaban Mana fight. We will not be touched. Only you will taste steel. Dismiss your concern. We are safe. You will have no killing to regret. Richard loosed the sword's magic, the rage. The two circles moved and chanted faster, spun their weapons faster. The storm of the sword's anger thundered through the seeker. Even in the grip of the rage, the wanton need to kill, he knew it wasn't going to be enough. They were too many, and he had never seen anyone handle weapons the way these people did. Heedlessly, he pulled more of the magic to him, pulled until the mercilessness of the hate pounded in his head and nearly made him sick. He drew it into the depths of his soul. Richard stood still in the center of the moving circles. He touched the gleaming blade to his forehead. The steel was cold against his hot skin, against his sweat. Blade, be true this day. He called the magic onward. Before he even realized what he was doing, he pulled off his shirt and threw it aside to be free of any hindrance to his movement. Why would he think to do that? It seemed the right thing to do, but he had no idea where the thought came from. He drew the blade up straight before him. His muscles flexed and tightened, glistening with sweat. He found the center of himself, that place of quiet, of focus. He sought his Han within the white-hot center of his rage. Use what you have, a voice within him said. Use what is there. Let it loose. In the quiet of his mind, Richard remembered the time he had stood on Zed's wizard's rock to use its magic to hide the cloud that Dark and Rahl had sent to track him. The rock had been used by many wizards before Zed. As Richard had stood on it, calling the magic onward, letting it flow through him, he had felt the essence of those who had come before. He remembered the way it had felt to feel the things they had felt, to know the things they had known. It had given him insight into those who had once used the magic. Suddenly, he knew what the prophecy meant. He wondered how it was possible to have used the sword before without seeing it, without seeing what the magic held, just like the wizard's rock. Others had used the Sword of Truth's magic, and in the bargain the magic retained a memory of their talents at fighting, of every move in which it had ever been used. The talent of untold hundreds who had wielded this blade, men and women alike, was there for the taking. The skill of both the good and the wicked was bound into the magic. In his stillness, he saw the first come from the left. Be a feather, not a rock. Float on the wind of the storm. Richard unleashed the magic and spun with the attack, letting it sweep past him. He didn't strike, but let himself float with the press of the charge. He let the sword's magic guide him. The attacker tumbled to the ground when he didn't make the expected contact. Instantly, another came, twirling his spear. Richard spun around again, and as the attacker passed, he used the sword to splinter the shaft in two. A spear point thrusted toward him. Without stopping, he glided past it and brought the sword up, cutting the shaft in half. Another charge came from behind. He met it with a foot to the chest, throwing the man back. Richard gave himself over to the magic from the sword and to the peace within himself, things he didn't even understand he was doing without thought. He controlled the rage to keep from killing. He used the flat of the blade to strike the back of a head here, used his feet to trip in advance there. The faster they came, the faster he reacted, the magic feeding off their energy. Fluidly, he slipped among the attackers, splintering spears where he could, trying to disarm the Bakaban Mana without killing them. Du Shailu, stop this before I have to hurt them. Yelling at her was a mistake. It distracted him. It allowed a spear through his flowing defense. He had a choice as the rage instantly exploded at the threat. He could kill the attacker or do only what was necessary to stop him. His sword spun its tip whistling through the air and lopped off the hand that thrust the spear. Blood and fragments of bone filled the air. The scream was a woman's. Some of the Bakaban Mana were women, he realized. It didn't matter. They would kill him if he didn't defend himself. Losing a hand was better than losing your head. First blood brought the rage, the need to kill, boiling up within him, hot and thirsty for more. He fought the attackers and fought the things within himself that wanted to press the attack to those around him, he didn't want to press the attack. He only wanted them to stop. But if they didn't stop... When he broke their spears, they picked up others and threw themselves at him again. He slipped among them like a phantom, conserving his energy as he let them wear themselves out. The outer ring, who had continued to circle while the inner one had attacked, stopped, and then swords a whirl. 
began advancing. Those with the spears, the ones who were still standing, stepped back through the outer ring as it came forward. Swords spun in the air. Instead of waiting for them to come to him, Richard went to them. They flinched in surprise as the sword of truth shattered two of the flashing blades. Do Shilu, please. I don't want to kill any of you. The ones with the swords were faster than the ones with the spears. Too fast. Talking and trying to disarm them without killing was a dangerous distraction. Richard felt a hot pain flash through the flesh over his ribs. He hadn't even seen the blade coming, but he had moved by instinct and received a shallow slash instead of a killing cut. His own blood being drawn summoned the sword's magic to his defense, the rage, the skill of those who had held it before him. Their essence seared through him, and he couldn't hold it back. There was no choice anymore. It overwhelmed his restraint. He had given them every chance. He was beyond retrieval now. Bringer of death. The swordsmen rushed in a deadly wave. He loosed the magic with a vengeance. The stalling was over. The barriers down, he danced with death now. The night erupted in a warm mist of blood. He heard himself screaming, and he felt himself moving. He saw men and women falling as disembodied heads tumbled across the ground. The lust for it raged through him. No blade touched him again. He countered every strike as if he had seen it a thousand times before, as if he had always known what to do. Every attack brought a sure and swift death to the attacker. Bone fragments and blood exploded through the night air. Gore sluiced across the ground. The horror of it all melted together into one long, killing image. Bringer of death. He only realized he had his knife in his left hand and his sword in his right when two came from opposite sides at once. He hooked his arm around the neck of the one on the left and slit his throat, while at the same time running the one on the right through with the sword. Both collapsed to the ground as Richard stood panting. Quiet echoed around him. There was no movement except for one on her knees, holding herself up with one hand. Her other hand was missing. She rose to her feet, pulling a knife from her belt. Through his glower, Richard watched the determination in her eyes. She ran for him with a scream. Richard stood deathlike in a cold cocoon of magic. The rage pounded as he watched her come. She raised the knife. Richard's sword whipped up and impaled her through the heart. The dead weight of her pulled the sword down as she slid off it to the ground, her last breath gurgling out as her fingers grasped the blade, sliding down its wet red length as she slipped into the hands of death. Bringer of death. Richard lifted his smoldering glare to the woman standing on the rock. Du Shailu stepped down, unwrapped her head, letting the long cloth hang down, and went to one knee in a bow. Richard, his rage burning hotly, strode to her. He lifted Du Shailu's chin with the sword's point. Her dark eyes stared up into his. The Kaharan has come. Who is the Kaharan? Du Shailu looked unflinchingly into his eyes. The one who dances with the spirits. Dances with the spirits. Richard repeated in a flat tone. He understood. He had danced with the spirits of those who held the sword before him. He had called the dead forth, danced with their spirits. He almost laughed. I will never forgive you, Du Shailu, for making me kill those people. I saved your life because I abhor killing, and you have brought the blood of thirty to my hands. I am sorry, Kaharin, that you must bear this burden. But only through the blood of thirty Bakabanmana could the killing stop. Only in this way can we serve the spirits. How is killing serving the spirits? When the magic men stole our land, they banished us to this place. They placed upon us the duty of teaching the Kaharan to dance with the spirits. Only the Kaharan can stop the dark spirit from taking the world of the living. The Kaharan is given to the world as a newborn babe who must be taught. Part of this duty is placed upon us to teach him to dance with the spirits. You have learned something this night, have you not? Richard gave a grim nod. I am the keeper of the laws of our people. It was our calling to teach you this. If we were to ignore what the old words tell us we must do, then the Kaharan would not learn what is within himself, and he would be defenseless against the forces of death. In the end, death would have everyone. The Majendi sacrifice us to remind us always of our duty to the spirits and to remind us to practice with the blades. The witch women to the other side aid the Majendi so that we will be surrounded with no way of escape and nowhere to go, so that we will always be under threat and unable to ever forget our duty. 
It is proclaimed that the Kaharin will announce his arrival by dancing with the spirits and spilling the blood of thirty Bakaban Mana, a feat none but the Chosen One could accomplish except with the aid of the spirits. It is said that when this happens, then we are his to rule. We are no longer a free people, but bound to his wishes, to your wishes, Kaharin. The old words say that if every year the one who wears the prayer dress goes to our land to give our prayers to the spirits, then one year they will send the Kaharin, and if we carry out our duty, then he will return our land to us. Richard stood, as if in a dream, glaring down at the woman. You have taken something precious from me this night, Du Shailu. She came to her feet, straightening before him. Do not speak to me of sacrifice, Kaharin. My five husbands, whom I loved, whom my children loved, who have not seen me since I was captured, were among the thirty you have just killed. Richard sank to his knees. He felt like he might be sick. Du Shailu, forgive me for what I have done this night. She gently put a hand to his bowed head. It has been my honor to be the spirit woman of our people when the Kaharin has come, to be the one to wear the prayer dress and bring him to his people. You must do your duty now and return our land as the old words tell us. Richard lifted his head. And do the old words say how I am to accomplish this task? She slowly shook her head. Only that we are to help you, and that you will. We are yours to command. In the dark, Richard felt a tear run down his cheek. Then I command that the killing stop. You will do as I have already ordered. You will use the bird whistle to bring peace with the Majendi. While you are doing that, you will do as you promised and have someone guide us to the palace of the prophets. Without looking up, Du Shailu snapped her fingers. Richard realized for the first time that people in the shadows surrounded the bloody clearing. All were on their knees, bowed toward him. At the snap of her fingers, several sprang forward. Guide them to the big stone house. Richard stood before her, looking into her dark eyes. Du Shailu, I'm so sorry I killed your husbands. I begged you to stop it, but I'm so sorry. Her eyes bore the timeless look he had seen in the eyes of others, Sister Verna, Shota the witch woman, and Kalin. He knew now that it was the gift he was seeing. A ghost of a smile came to her lips. He didn't know how she could smile at a time like this. They fought as hard as any Bakaban Mana have ever fought. They had the honor of teaching the Kaharin. They have given their lives for their people. They brought honor to themselves and will live on as legends. She reached out and placed her hand on his bare chest, on the handprint there. You are my husband now. Richard's eyes widened. What? She gave a curious frown. I wear the prayer dress. I am the spirit woman of our people. You are the Kaharan. It is the old law. You are my husband. Richard shook his head. No, I'm not. I already have... He was going to say he already had a love, but the words caught in his throat. Kalin had sent him away. He had nothing. She shrugged. It could be worse for you. The last one who wore the prayer dress was old and wrinkled. She had no teeth. I hope that I bring at least some pleasure to your eyes and maybe someday a song to your heart. But I belong to the Kaharan. It is not for you or me to decide. Yes, it is. He looked about and then snatched up his shirt. As he put it on, he saw Sister Verna at the edge of the clearing, watching him like a bug in a box. He turned to Du Shailu. You have a job to do. You will do it. The killing is ended. The sister and I must get to the palace so I can get this collar off. Du Shailu leaned over and kissed his cheek. Until I see you again, Richard, seeker, Kaharan, husband. Chapter 49 Richard and Sister Verna sat on their horses, anchoring long, thin shadows as they looked down from the grassy prominence. Trees meandered along the low places among some of the hills and blanketed others in dusky green. The vast city below lay awash in a straw-colored haze that muted the colors into a mellow monotone. The distant, tiled and shingled roofs shimmered in the rays of the setting sun like points of light on a pond. Richard had never seen so many buildings laid out in such an orderly array. Off to the edges, they were smaller, but toward the core they seemed to grow, both in size and in grandeur. The faraway sounds of tens of thousands of people and horses and wagons drifted all the way up to them on the hill, carried on the light, salty breeze. A river meandered through the collection of countless buildings, dividing the city, with the part on the far side twice as large. 
At the edge of the city, docks lined the banks along the mouth of the majestic river. Boats of all sizes were not only moored there, but dotted the river, their white sails filled with air. Some of the boats he could just make out had three masts. Richard had never imagined that such large boats might exist. Despite being there against his will, Richard found himself fascinated by the city, by all the people and all the sights it must hold. He had never seen such a place. He imagined a person could probably walk around for days and days and not begin to see it all. Beyond, shimmering with golden sparkles and reflections, lay the sea, stretching to a knife's edge line at the horizon. Dominating the city near the center, rising up on an island of its own, stood a vast palace, its imposing crenellated west wall bathed in the sun's golden rays. Baileys and ramparts and towers and sections and roofs, all of grand design, joined together into a complex structure that held labyrinthine courtyards with trees or grass or ponds. The palace seemed to be stretching its stone arms, jealously trying to enclose the whole of the island atop which it sat. Seen from this distance, with the thread-thin streets radiating out from the island at the core of the city and strand-like bridges spanning the river all around, the palace reminded Richard of nothing as much as a fat spider sitting in the center of its web. The Palace of the Prophets, Sister Verna said. Prison, Richard said without looking to her. She ignored the comment. The city is Tanamura, and through it, the River Kern. The palace itself sits on Hallsband Island. Hallsband? His hackles rose. Is that some kind of sardonic joke? What do you mean? Does Hall's Band have significance? Richard raised an eyebrow. A Hall's Band is a collar used to launch a hunting hawk on an attack. She shrugged dismissively. You read too much into things. Do I? We shall see. She let out a small sigh as she lifted her hips, starting her horse down the hill and changed the subject. It's been many years since I was home, but it looks as it always has. The two Bakaban Mana men who had guided them through the swampy, trackless forest for the last two days, had left them that morning, once Sister Verna was at last in familiar territory. Although he never lost his sense of direction, Richard could easily see how people could become disoriented there. But he was at home in such places of vast desolation, and was more likely to become lost in a building than in dense woods. The two men had spoken little over those two days. Though they were swordsmen as fierce as those Richard had fought, they were in awe of him. Richard had to shout before they would stop all the bowing. No amount of shouting, though, could make them stop calling him Kaharin. One night, before he went to stand his usual watch, Sister Verna had told him in a quiet tone that she was sorry that he had had to kill those thirty people. A little surprised by her sincerity and the seeming lack of meaning other than that stated and haunted by the memory, he had thanked her for understanding. Richard scanned the fertile hills and valleys. Why isn't this land farmed? With all those people, they must need to plant food. Sister Verna lifted a hand holding the reins and indicated the land on the other side of the city. Farms cover the land on that side of the river. On this side, it's not safe for man nor beast. Tilting her head back, she indicated the land behind. The Bakaban Mana are always a threat. So they don't farm here because they're afraid of the Bakaban Mana? She cast a glance to her left. Do you see that dark forest? She watched him as he took in the fringe of the dense tangle in the next valley. Huge old gnarled trees were packed close together, covered with vines and moss and harboring gloomy shadows. This edge runs for miles more toward the city. It's the Hagen Woods. Stay far away from it. All who let the sun set on them in the Hagen Woods die. Many who set foot there die before they have a chance to wait for the sun to go down. It's a place of vile magic. As they rode, he kept glancing toward the Hagen Woods. He felt a longing for that gloomy place, as if it complemented his dark mood. As if he belonged in there, he found it hard to draw his eyes away. Up close, the streets of Tanamura were not the orderly place they appeared from a distance. The fringes of the city were a confusion of squalor, men pushing or pulling carts laden with loads of rice sacks or carpets or firewood or hides or even garbage, wove around and past each other, sometimes clogging the way. Lining the road were hawkers of every sort, selling everything from fruits and vegetables and strips of meat cooked on little sticks over tiny smoky fires and impromptu stone hearths to herbs and fortunes, 
to boots and beads. At least the cooking gave spotty relief from the reeking stench of tanneries. Huddled groups of men in worn, dirty clothes shouted with excitement or burst into laughter around games of cards and dice. Side streets and narrow alleyways were clogged with people and lined with ramshackle huts of tarp and tin. Naked children ran and played among the flimsy shelters, splashing in muddy puddles and chasing each other in games of catch the fox. Women squatted around buckets, washing clothes and chatting among themselves. Sister Verna muttered to herself that she didn't remember the squalor and the unhoused multitudes. Richard thought that despite their condition, they looked happier than they had a right to. Despite having lived out of doors and being a little dirty and rumpled, Sister Verna, compared to these people, looked like royalty. Anyone coming close bowed in reverence to the sister, and she prayed for the Creator's blessing on them in return. The time-worn buildings, some faced with faded, crumbling plaster, some with age-darkened wood, were just as packed as the streets. Colorful wash hung from the rusty iron railings of nearly every tiny balcony. A few held pots of flowers or herbs, Laughter and the hum of conversation came from taverns and inns. A butcher's shop displayed fly-covered carcasses on the street out front. Other shops sold dried fish or grain or oils. The farther he and the sister went, the cleaner the city became. The road widened. Even the side streets were wider, and none had huts leaning against the buildings. The shops had bigger windows with painted shutters and better-looking wares, many displaying colorful, locally woven carpets. By the time the wide road became lined with trees, the buildings were grand. The inns looked elegant, with doormen standing in red uniforms before them. On the stone bridge over the Kern, men were lighting lamps hung on poles to show the way in the gathering darkness. In the river below the bridge, fishermen in small boats with lanterns rowed through the dark water. Soldiers in ornate uniforms with gold-trimmed white shirts and red tunics and carrying pole arms patrolled each side of the river. As the horse's hooves clopped along the cobblestone, Sister Verna finally spoke. It's a great day at the palace when a new one with the gift arrives. She cast him a brief sideways glance. It's a rare and joyous event. They will be happy to see you, Richard. Please remember that. To them, this is an event of note in their calling. Though you feel differently, their hearts will be warmed by the sight of you. They will want you to feel welcome. Richard thought otherwise. Make your point. I just did. They will be delighted. What you are saying, in other words, is you would like me not to horrify them right off. I didn't say that. She glanced with a small frown at the soldiers guarding the bridge. She finally looked back to him. I am simply asking you to realize that these women live for this very thing. Richard stared ahead as he rode past more guards in dress uniforms. A wise person, a person I love, told me once that we all can only be who we are, no more and no less. His gaze swept the top of the wall ahead, noting the soldiers there and what arms they carried. I'm the bringer of death, and I have nothing to live for. That's not true, Richard, she said in a quiet tone. You're a young man, and you have much to live for. You have a long life ahead of you. And though you may have named yourself the bringer of death, I have seen you do nothing but strive to stop the killing. Sometimes you will not listen and make matters worse, but it's through ignorance, not malice. Since you abhor lies, sister, I'm sure you wouldn't want me to pretend to feel other than I do. She sighed as they went through a huge gate in the thick outer bailey wall, the horse's hooves echoing inside the long arched opening. Beyond, the road meandered among low spreading trees. Windows in the buildings rising up all around were aglow with soft yellow light. Many of the buildings were connected by covered colonnades or enclosed halls with arched openings covered over with lattice work. Benches dotted the far side of the courtyard against a wall with a frieze carved with figures on horses. Through archways with white painted gates, they came to the stables. Horses browsed in a field beyond. Boys dressed in neat livery with black vests over tan shirts came to hold the horses as he and the sister dismounted. Richard gave Bonnie's neck a scratch and then started taking down his belongings. Sister Verna brushed out the wrinkles in her divided riding skirt and straightened her light cloak. She fussed at her curly hair. No need for that, Richard. Someone will bring your things. No one touches my things but me, he said. She sighed and shook her head, and then told the boy to have her things brought in. He bowed to her and then hooked a lead line on Jessup. He gave a sharp snap on the line. Jessup balked. The boy brought a whip around on Jessup's rump. Move, you dumb beast! 
Jessup bellowed as he tried to yank his head away. The next thing Richard knew, the boy was flying across the walkway. He slammed up against a flimsy wooden wall and landed on his seat as a glowering Sister Verna loomed over him. Don't you dare whip that horse! What's the matter with you? How would you like it if I did that to you? In shock, the boy shook his head. If I ever hear of you whipping a horse again, you will be without a job after I whip your skinny bottom. The wide-eyed lad gave a quick nod and apology. Sister Verna glared a moment longer and then turned, whistling for her horse. When Jessup trotted up, she scratched him under his chin, comforting and calming him. She led him inside to a stall and saw that he had water and hay. Richard made sure she didn't see his smile. As they walked across the courtyard, she said, Just remember, Richard. There isn't a sister here, or even a novice, who, while at the same time as she was yawning, couldn't throw you across a room like that with her Han. Inside a wood-paneled hall, with long yellow and blue carpets running under ornate side tables, three women waited. They became all a twitter at the sight of Sister Verna. Sister Verna was a head shorter than he, and none of these three women were as tall as she. They smoothed their full pastel skirts and tugged at the white bodices. Sister Verna, one cried out as the three rushed up. Oh, dear Sister Verna, it's so good to see you at last. A tear or two ran down their rosy faces. Their smiles looked about to burst their cheeks. Each looked a good deal younger than Sister Verna. She surveyed the big, wet eyes. Sister Verna tenderly stroked the sniffling face before her. Sister Phoebe, she touched another's hand. And Sister Amelia and Sister Janet, it's so good to see you again. It has been a long time indeed. The three giggled with excitement, at last composing themselves. Sister Phoebe's round face looked about past Richard. Where is he? Why haven't you brought him in with you? Sister Verna lifted her hand toward Richard. This is he. Richard, these are friends of mine. Sisters Phoebe, Amelia, and Janet. The smiles transformed into astonished looks. They blinked as they took in his size and age. They stared in open amazement before finally sputtering over each other's words about how glad they were to meet him. They tore their eyes from him at last and returned their attention to Sister Verna. Better than half the palace is waiting to greet you both, Sister Phoebe said. Everyone has been so excited since we received word that you would arrive today. Sister Amelia smoothed back her fine, light brown hair, flipping back the ends that barely brushed her shoulders. No other has been brought in since you left for Richard. All those years and no other. Everyone is so eager to meet him. I guess they are in for a big surprise, she said as she blushed, glancing sideways at him. Some of the younger sisters especially. A pleasant surprise, I would say. My, but he is big. Richard remembered a time when he was little, when he had been imprisoned in his house by a pouring rain. His mother had some women friends visiting to help in the making of a quilt and to pass the time in conversation. As they sat and sewed while he played on the floor, they discussed him as if he weren't there, talking about how he was growing, and his mother had told how much he ate and how good he was at reading. In similar discomfort now, Richard shifted his pack up higher on his shoulder. Sister Phoebe turned to him and just beamed. She reached out and touched his arm. Listen to us go on. We shouldn't talk about you like you weren't here. Welcome, Richard. Welcome to the Palace of the Prophets. Richard silently watched the three sisters blinking up at him. Sister Amelia giggled and said to Sister Verna, He doesn't talk much, does he? He talks enough, Sister Verna said. Under her breath, she added, Thank the Creator he is quiet for now. Well, Sister Phoebe said in a bright voice, Shall we go? Sister Verna frowned at her. Sister Phoebe, who are the troops I saw, the ones in the strange uniforms? Sister Phoebe's brow wrinkled in thought a moment. Then her eyebrows lifted. Oh, those troops! She dismissed it with a wave. The government was overthrown a few years back. I guess it must have been while you were away. The old world has a new government again. We have an emperor now, instead of all those kings. She looked to Sister Janet. What is it they call themselves? Her brow creased in thought. Sister Janet's eyes turned toward the ceiling. Oh, yes, she said in a demure voice. The imperial order. And you are quite right, Sister Phoebe. They have an emperor. She nodded. Yes, the imperial order led by an emperor. Sister Phoebe shook her head in wonder. Such foolishness. Governments come and governments go, but the palace of the prophets always remains. The creator's hand shelters us. Shall we go greet the others? Following behind the three, they passed through warmly decorated passageways and halls. As far as Richard was concerned, he was in hostile territory. 
threat always caused the magic of the sword of truth to try to seep into him to protect him. He let in a trickle, keeping the anger on a slow burn. Sister Verna glanced sideways occasionally, as if measuring the growth of his glower. At last, they went through a pair of thick walnut doors that opened into a vast chamber. They had to pass under a low ceiling in between white columns with gold capitals before entering under a huge vaulted dome painted with immense scenes of people in robes surrounding a glowing figure. Two levels of balconies with ornate stone railings ringed the circular room. Stained glass windows lit the top balcony from behind. The floor of the room was made up of small, light, and dark wood squares laid out in a zigzag pattern. The hum of well over a hundred voices echoed around the chamber. Women stood in bunches around the floor, and more lined the balconies. Scattered among the women on the second level were some men and boys. The women, all sisters of the light, he presumed, were dressed in finery. There seemed to be no pattern. Their dresses were of every color, with designs ranging from conservative to revealing. The boys and men were dressed in everything from plain robes to coats as elaborate as Richard imagined any lord or prince would wear. The buzz of talking died out as everyone began turning to the new arrivals. As the room fell to silence, applause started, swelling into a roar. Sister Phoebe took a few steps toward the center of the room, raising her hand, calling for silence. The applause died out in spurts. Sisters, Sister Phoebe said, her voice trembling with excitement. Please welcome Sister Verna home. The applause roared again, and after a few moments, the hand brought it to silence once more. And may I present our newest student, our newest child of the Creator, our newest charge, she turned, holding her hand out, wiggling her fingers, indicating she wanted Richard to step forward. He took three strides to her, Sister Verna going with him. Sister Phoebe leaned close and whispered, Richard, do you have any more to your name? Richard hesitated a moment. Cipher. She turned back to the crowd. Please welcome Richard Cipher to the Palace of the Prophets. The clapping started again. Richard glowered as every face watched him. Women near pressed closer to get a better look at him. There were women of all ages and descriptions in the crowd, ranging from some who looked old enough to be kindly grandmothers to some hardly old enough to be called women, with those of every age in between. They ranged from plump to skinny, with hair as different as their dress, with every color from blonde to black. Their eyes, too, were of every color. He noticed one woman who stood near him. She had a warm smile on her reed-thin lips and strange pale blue eyes with violet flecks through them. She was looking at him, as if he were an old, dear friend whom she loved and hadn't seen in years. She was applauding enthusiastically and elbowing a haughty woman next to her to join in the clapping until the other finally did. Richard stood with his arms at his sides as he studied the layout of the room, noting exits, passageways, and placement of guards. As the applause died out, a young woman in a dress the same shade of blue as Kalin's wedding dress worked her way through the crowd. The blue dress had a round neck decorated with white lace that ran down to the narrow waist and matched that on the cuffs. She approached, coming to a halt right in front of him. Perhaps five years younger than he and a head shorter, she had full, soft brown hair that reached to her shoulders and big brown eyes. She gaped at him. With each slow breath, her bosom swelled at the lace. Her hand floated up. Her delicate fingers brushed his cheek and stroked down his beard. She seemed transfixed as she stared up at him stroking his beard. The Creator has indeed heard my prayers, she whispered to herself. She seemed to suddenly remember where she was and snatched her hand back, her face flushed red. I'm... I'm... she stammered. She regained her composure, her face recovering its smooth complexion. She clasped her hands before herself and turned as if nothing had happened to address Sister Verna. I'm Pasha Mays, novice, third rank. I am next in line to be named. I have been placed in charge of Richard. Sister Verna gave her a small, tight smile. I think I remember you, Pasha. I'm pleased to see you have studied hard and done well. Richard is passed out of my hands now and into yours. May the Creator gently hold you both in his hands. Pasha smiled proudly and then turned to Richard. She cast a glance down the length of him. She looked up, batted her eyelashes at him, and gave him a warm smile. I'm pleased to meet you, young man. My name is Pasha. You are assigned to me. I'm to help teach you, help with whatever else you may need in your studies. I'm a guide of sorts. Any problems or questions you have are to be brought to me, and I will do my best to help you. 
You look like a bright boy. I'm sure we are going to get along just fine. Page 510. Her smile faltered under the heat of his gloves. She smiled again and continued. Well, first of all, Richard, we don't allow boys to carry weapons here at the Palace of the Prophets. She held her hands out, palms up. I'll take your sword. The trickle of rage from the magic had turned to a torrent. You are welcome to my sword when I am no longer breathing. Pasha's gaze flicked to Sister Verna. The sister gave a slow, slight shake of her head in stern warning. Pasha's gaze returned to Richard, and her frown transformed to a smile. Well, we'll talk about it later. Her brow bunched together. But you need to learn some manners, young man. Richard's voice came in a tone that took some of the color from Pasha's face. Which one of these women is the prelate? Pasha gave a bubble of a laugh. The prelate is not here. She is much too busy to take me to her. You do not see the prelate when you wish. She sees you when she has reason to see you. I can hardly believe Sister Verna has not taught you that we do not allow our boys... Richard put the back of his hand against her shoulder and swept her aside as he took another stride into the room, redirecting his glare to the hundreds of eyes watching him. I have something to say. The vast room fell to a hush. From two different places in his mind, the same thought had come forward at the same time. He recognized each origin. One was the adventures of Bonnie Day, the book his father had given him, and the other was the sword's magic, the knowledge of the sword, the spirits he had danced with. The memory and message were the same. When you are outnumbered and the situation is hopeless, you have no option. You must attack. He knew what the collar was for. His situation was hopeless. He had no options. He let the quiet ring in the chamber until it was uncomfortable. His fingers tapped his Radha Han. As long as you keep this collar on me, you are my captors and I am your prisoner. Murmurs hummed in the air. Richard let them trail off before he went on. Since I have committed no aggression against you, that makes us enemies. We are at war. Sister Verna has made a pledge to me that I will be taught to control the gift, and when I have learned what is required, I will be set free. For now, as long as you keep that pledge, we have a truce. But there are conditions. Richard lifted the red leather rod at his neck, the Aegeal in his hand. Beyond the rage of the magic, the Aegeal was only a dim tingle of pain. I have been collared before. The person who put that collar on me brought me pain to punish me, to teach me, to subdue me. That is the sole purpose of a collar. You collar a beast. You collar your enemies. I made her much the same offer I am making you. I begged her to release me. She would not. I was forced to kill her. Not one of you could ever hope to be good enough to lick her boots. She did as she did because she was tortured and broken, made mad enough to use a collar to hurt people. She did it against her nature. You. He looked to all the eyes. You do it because you think it is your right. You enslave in the name of your creator. I don't know your creator. The only one beyond this world I know who would do as you do is the keeper. The crowd gasped. As far as I'm concerned, you may as well be the keeper's disciples. If you do as she and use this collar to bring me pain, the truce will be ended. You may think you hold the leash to this collar, but I promise you, if the truce ends, you will find that what you hold is a bolt of lightning. Dead still silence rang in the room. Richard rolled up his left sleeve. He drew the sword of truth. The distinctive sound of steel filled the silence. The Bakaban Mana are my people. They have agreed to live in peace with all people from now on. Anyone who harms one of them will answer to me. If you do not accept this, do not let the Bakaban Mana live in peace. Our truce will be ended. He pointed back with the sword. Sister Verna captured me. I have fought her every step of this journey. She has done everything short of killing me and draping my body over a horse to get me here. Though she too is my captor and enemy, I owe her certain debts. If anyone lays a finger to her because of me, I will kill that person and the truce will be ended. From the corner of his eye, Richard could see Sister Verna's eyes close. Her hand covered her white face. The crowd gasped as Richard drew his sword across the inside of his arm. He turned it, wiping both sides in the blood until it dripped from the tip. His knuckles white around the hilt, he thrust the blade into the air. I give you a blood oath. Harm the Bakaban Mana, harm Sister Verna, or harm me, and the truce will be ended. And I promise you we will have war. 
If we have war, I will lay waste to the palace of the prophets. From the far balcony, where Richard couldn't see its source, a mocking voice drifted out over the crowd. All by yourself. Doubt me at your peril. I am a prisoner. I have nothing to live for. I am the flesh of prophecy. I am the bringer of death. No answer came in the silence. He slammed his sword home into its scabbard. Richard held his arms out as he gave a gracious bow. He came up smiling. Now that we all understand each other, understand the truce, you ladies may go back to your celebration of my capture. He turned his back on the stunned crowd. Sister Verna's head was lowered, her hand covering her face. Pasha's lips were pressed so tightly together they were turning blue. A stout, stern-faced woman crossed in front of him, stopping before Sister Verna. The woman held her nose in the air until Sister Verna lifted her head and straightened her back. Sister Verna, it is obvious you have neither the talent nor skill to be a sister of the light. Your failure is quite beyond the pale. As of this moment, you are broken to novice first rank. You will serve as a novice until such time as, and if the Creator wills, you earn the title of Sister of the Light. Sister Verna lifted her chin. Yes, Sister Marin. Novices do not speak to a sister unless asked to. I did not ask you to speak. She held out a hand. Surrender your dakra. Sister Verna flicked her hand, the silver knife appearing from her sleeve. She twirled it, presented the handle to the other woman, and then stood silent, her eyes straight ahead. At dawn tomorrow, you will report to the kitchens. You will scrub pots until you are judged worthy to attempt something more demanding of your intelligence. Do you understand? Yes, Sister Marin, I understand. And if you even look like you are going to give me any back talk, it will be the stables instead of the kitchens, cleaning stalls and hauling manure. In that case, Sister Marin, I will report directly to the stables instead of the kitchens and save your ears what it is I would say to you. Sister Marin's face reddened. Very well, novice, the stables it is. Sister Marin paused before Richard, giving him a tight smile. I trust that does not break your truce. She lifted her chin and stormed off. The room was silent. Richard looked to Sister Verna, but the sister stared straight ahead. Pasha, her face set in a scowl, suddenly put herself between them. Verna is no longer your concern. Your arm is bleeding. Since you are my charge, I will tend to it. She took a calming breath as she twined her fingers together before her waist. There is a big banquet to welcome you, beginning in the dining room. Maybe you will feel better about all of us after the banquet. Everyone is looking forward to it. Everyone wants a chance to personally welcome you. She shook a finger at him. And you will be on your best behavior, young man. Having put the sword away, he had put most of the anger away. Most, but not all. I'm not hungry. Show me to my dungeon, child. Her fists tightened on her blue skirts. With a dark look, she considered him a moment. Very well. Have it your way. You can just go to bed without your supper like a spoiled child. She turned on her heel. Follow me. Chapter 50 Sister Verna put her hand to the brass lever. The room was shielded. She took a controlled breath and then knocked. A muffled voice behind the heavy door answered. Come. The shield dissolved. She opened the right side of the double doors and stepped in. Two women sat, each at her own desk, to each side of the door beyond. Both were writing in ledgers. Neither looked up. Yes, the one to the left said as she continued writing. What is it? I have come to return the journey book, Sister Ulyssia. Sister Ulyssia wet her finger and flipped a page. Yes, just put it on the desk. Shouldn't you be at the banquet in honor of your return? I would think you would want to get reacquainted with old friends. Sister Verna clasped her hands. I have more important matters to attend than banquets. I wish to give the journey book to the prelate personally. And I wish to speak with her, Sister Ulyssia. They both looked up. Well, Sister Ulyssia said, the prelate does not wish to speak with you, Sister Verna. She is a busy woman. She can't be bothered with unimportant matters. Unimportant? It is not unimportant. Do not raise your voice in this office, Sister Verna, the other warned. She dipped her pen in an ink bottle and bent back over her writing. Sister Verna took a step forward. The air between the desks before the door beyond shimmered suddenly with a powerful shield that hissed and crackled in warning. The prelate is busy, Sister Ulyssia said. If she deems your return of consequence, she will send for you. She pulled a candle closer and bent back to her book. Just put the journey book on my desk. I will see that it's returned to her. Sister Verna controlled her voice as she gritted her teeth. I have been broken down to novice. They both glanced up. 
broke into novice because I followed the orders of that woman. Despite my pleas and appeals, she forbade me to do my job, my duty, and because of that I am to be punished, punished for doing as the prelate ordered me to do. I will at least hear the reasons. Sister Ulyssia leaned back in her chair and then turned to the other woman. Sister Fenella, please send a report to the headmistress of the novices. Inform her that novice Verna Sylvandrine came to the prelate's office without authorization or invitation, and further, she carried on in a tirade unbecoming of a novice, hoping one day to be a sister of the light. Sister Fenella shifted herself in annoyance as she glared up at Sister Verna. My, my, novice Verna, your first day in your pursuit of higher calling, and already you've earned a letter of reprimand. She clicked her tongue. I do so hope you learn to behave yourself if you ever hope to be a sister of the light. That will be all, novice, Sister Ulyssia said. You are dismissed. Sister Verna turned on her heel. She heard the snap of fingers. She looked back over her shoulder to see Sister Ulyssia tapping the corner of her desk. The journey book? And I don't believe that is the way a novice departs when she is dismissed by a sister. Is it, novice? Sister Verna pried the small black book from behind her belt and gently set it on the corner of the desk. No, sister, it is not, she curtsied. Thank you, sisters, for your time. Sister Verna sighed to herself as she closed the door against her back. She stood for a moment, considering. Eyes to the floor before her, she made her way back through the palace, down halls both opened and closed, both stone and paneled, across floors carpeted and tiled. Rounding a corner, she came suddenly upon someone. She looked up into a face she had been hoping not to see. He smiled in a familiar manner. Verna, how good to see you. His young, square-jawed face looked unchanged. His wavy brown hair was worn a little longer over his ears than before, and his shoulders were broader than she remembered. She had to restrain herself from touching his cheek, from falling into his arms. She bowed her head. Jedediah, she gazed up into his brown eyes. You look fit. You look the same as you have always looked. You wear the time well. You look, I guess, the word you are searching for is old. I look old. Ah, Verna, a few wrinkles. He glanced down her body. A few pounds do not diminish a beauty such as yours. I see your tongue is still in good form around women. She glanced to his plain tan robes. And I can see you've been a good student as always and have managed to advance yourself. I'm proud of you, Jedediah. He shrugged off the compliment and pressed his fingers together. Tell me about the new one you brought in. Her eyes narrowed. You've not seen me in twenty-odd years since I rose from your bed to go on my journey, and that is your question for me? Not how have I fared? Not how do I feel about you after all this time? Not has your heart found another? Well, I guess the shock of seeing how I've aged has made those questions fly right from your head. The sly smile stayed on his lips. Verna, you're not a silly girl. Surely you must realize that in the passing of so much time, neither of us could be expected to. Of course I know that. I had no delusions of us. I had simply hoped to return and be treated with a little tact and sensitivity. He shrugged again. I'm sorry, Verna. I always thought of you as a woman who appreciated candor, one who had no use for word sports. His eyes went out of focus. I guess I've learned so much about life since back then, when I was so young. She removed her glare from his handsome face and started away. Good night, Jedediah. What of my question? His voice had an unpleasant edge to it. He softened it. What's the new one like? She halted, but didn't turn. You were there. I saw you. What you saw of Richard is what he is. I also saw what happened to you. I'm gaining a little influence among some of the sisters. Maybe I can do something to help you with your situation. He gestured vaguely with a hand. If you're open with me and satisfy my curiosity... Maybe I can help you out of your unfortunate predicament. She started out again. Good night, Jedediah. I'll be seeing you around the palace, Verna. Think on it. She couldn't believe how ignorant she had been all those years. She remembered Jedediah as caring and sincere. Maybe her memory was addled. Maybe she was just thinking of herself and hadn't given him the chance to be kinder. She must look a mess. She should have cleaned herself up, put on a nice dress at least fixed her unruly hair before she saw Jedediah. But she had not had the chance. Maybe 
If she had touched his cheek, he would have remembered the spark of something, maybe remembered the tears he shed the day she left and the promises he had made, promises she knew the moment they left his lips would be broken before their echo faded so long ago. She came to the hall that led to the novice's apartments. She stood looking down at the doors. She was tired. Sun up to sundown in the stables was going to be exhausting. She turned the other way instead. She had one other thing to do before she slept. Pasha came to a stop before a doorway with a casing of stone, carved to look like vines. Nestled in the center of the stone vines was a large, round-topped, fumed oak door. Pasha lifted an eyebrow to him. Your dungeon. There's no bolt on the outside of the door. How will you lock me in? She seemed surprised by the question. We don't lock our boys in. You're free to come and go as you please. Richard frowned. You mean I'm free to roam this building? No. You're free to go wherever you wish. You may go almost anywhere in the palace or into the city if you wish. Most of the boys spend a great deal of their time in the city. Her face reddened a little at the last of what she had said, and she looked away from his face. What about the country around the city? She shrugged and then pulled the shoulder of her blue dress back up a little. Of course, I don't know why you would want to go into the countryside. None of the other boys do, but there's nothing stopping you from going outside either the palace or the city. A worried wrinkle came to her brow. But you must stay clear of the Hagen Woods. It is extremely dangerous. Were you warned about the Hagen Woods? Were you shown where it is while you journeyed to the palace? Richard nodded. How far may I go into the countryside? The Radha Han will prevent you from going too far afield. We must be able to find you, but the limit is a good number of miles in a radius around the Palace of the Prophets. How many miles? Farther than you would want to go. I expect almost all the way to the land of the savages. You mean the Bakaban Mana? She nodded. Nearly that far, I would expect. Unguarded? She put her hands on her hips. You are assigned to me. I will accompany you most everywhere you go, for now. After our boys are more experienced, they go off on their own when they wish. Whenever I want, I can simply wander around. Well, you live here at the palace, of course, and you must be around for your lessons. I will give your lessons, and so will a number of the sisters. We will teach you to touch your Han, and then once you are able to do that, we will begin to teach you how to control it. Why different sisters? Why not just one, or you? Because sometimes the Han of certain people works better together. Also, the sisters have more experience than me, have more knowledge. There may be one or several of us who are better able to help you, and so different sisters give you lessons until we discover with whom you work best. Will Sister Verna be one of those? Pasha gave him a look from under her eyebrows. Verna is no longer a sister. She is no longer entitled to the appellation. She is a novice now and should be addressed simply as Verna. Novices, other than the one assigned to you, that is me, are not allowed to give lessons. Novices of the first rank, like Verna, are not allowed to have anything to do with our boys. The duty of a novice is to learn, not to teach. Richard didn't think he could ever think of Sister Verna as simply Verna. It sounded too strange to him. When will she be a sister again? She must serve as a novice and advance as any other novice. I started scrubbing pots in the kitchen when I was little. It has taken me this long to be given this chance. One day, if Verna works as hard as I have, then she too will have the chance to be a sister of the light. Until then, Verna is a novice. Richard fumed at the thought of Sister Verna being demoted on his account. By the time she was again a sister, she would be an old woman. He changed the subject. And why are we allowed to roam around? Because you are not a danger to the people. Someday, when you learn to control your Han, then you begin to have limits placed on where you may go. The people in the city are afraid of boys who can wield the power. Unfortunate incidents have happened in the past. And so once a boy becomes skilled at handling his Han, he is then restricted from the city. As the boys advance as wizards, they are placed under more restrictions until near the end and their release when they are confined to certain areas of the palace. But for now, you're free to go almost anywhere you wish. I will know where you are all the time by your Radha Han. You mean any sister can find me by this cursed thing? No, only the one who gave it to you, because she held it and recognizes its power. And since I'm in charge of you, I must be able to know where you are at all times. So I will need to allow my Han to recognize your Radha Han's unique feel. She pushed the door open and went into the dark room. With a sweep of her arm, lamps set all around the room sprang to flame. You must teach me that trick, he muttered. It's not a trick, it's simply my Han. And that's the simplest of many things I will teach you. 
The ceiling of the huge room was painted around its molding with different colored lines and intricate patterns. The walls were paneled in cherry of a warm color. Tall windows hung with rich deep blue moire drapes looked out on the night. There was a fireplace with a white column to each side. Most of the wood floor was covered with thick carpets. Comfortable looking chairs and couches were placed around the room and arranged in front of the fireplace. Richard thought that his whole house would fit twice into the room. He slipped the pack off his back and leaned it against the wall next to the fireplace. He stood the quiver of arrows and the unstrung bow beside it. He went to the right to a set of double doors made up of small panes of glass and covered over with sheer cream-colored curtains. Beyond the doors was an expansive balcony overlooking the city. Stone urns filled with flowers were set about the slate floor of the balcony. He put his fingers to the marble railing as he looked to his right, past the sparkling lights of the city to the hills from where he had come. The sunsets are beautiful from this balcony, Pasha said. Richard wasn't interested in sunsets. He studied the courtyard below, the gates, the roads, the patrolling soldiers, and the bridges to the city and the hills beyond. He tried to fix a map of it all into his head. He went back inside and marched to the other end of the room, to the doorway there. Beyond was a bedroom almost as large as the first room. It held the largest bed he had ever seen, covered with a deep purple quilt. Another pair of glassed doors led to another balcony, but this one looked south, out over the sea. It's a beautiful view, Pasha said, a romantic view. She saw that he was looking to the sections of the palace below. She pointed. Across that courtyard are some of the women's quarters, where most of the sisters' rooms are. She shook the finger at him. You will stay away from them, young man. She turned away. Unless a sister invites you to her room, she added under her breath. What do I call you, he asked. Sister Pasha? She giggled. No, I'm a novice, though I hope to become a sister if I prove myself with you. Until then, I am simply Pasha. Richard turned to her, directing a glare to her eyes. My name is Richard. Do you have trouble remembering it? Look here, you are assigned to me, and if that is too difficult for you to remember, you have no chance of ever becoming a sister, because if you insist on trying to demean me by calling me by other than my name, I will see to it that you quickly fail in your test. He leaned over her as he glowered down at her wide eyes. Do you understand, Pasha? She swallowed. You will not raise your voice to me, young... She lifted her chin a little. You will not raise your voice to me, Richard. That's better. Thank you. He hoped she would leave it at that. He was in no mood to be kind if she was not. He turned away. This balcony held less of a view of the things he was interested in, and so he went back into the bedroom. She followed on his heels. Look here, Richard, you will learn some manners or else I will... That was the end of his indulgence. He spun to her. She lurched to a halt, almost colliding with him. You've never been in charge of anyone before, have you? She didn't move. I would say that this is the first time you have been given responsibility and you are terrified you will muck it up. Since you are inexperienced, you think acting like a tyrant will fool people into thinking you know what you are doing. Well, I... Her voice trailed off as he leaned down, putting his face close to hers. You should not be frightened of letting me see that you are inexperienced at commanding people, Pasha. What you should be frightened of is that I will kill you. Her eyes narrowed with indignation. Don't you dare threaten me. This is a game to you. A way for you to fulfill some arcane rules by prancing around, pulling your little puppy around by his collar, and training him to lick your hand, so you may gain a new rank. He gritted his teeth as he lowered his voice. It is not a game to me, Pasha. It's a matter of life and death. I am a prisoner held in a collar as a beast or a slave. I have only as much control of my life as you people allow. I know I am to be tortured by you as a way of breaking my will. You are wrong, Pasha, if you think that I'm making a threat. I'm not. I am making a promise. I'm not what you think of me, Richard, she said in a small voice. I want to be your friend. You are not my friend. You are my captor. He held a finger up in front of her face. Don't you ever turn your back on me because I will kill you, just as I killed the last person who held me prisoner in a collar. She blinked up at him. Richard, I don't know what happened to you before, but we're not like that. I want to be a sister of the light to help people see the Creator's goodness. Richard was dangerously close to letting the magic slip from his control. He struggled to maintain his grip. He had other things to do. I am not interested in your theology. Just remember what I told you. She smiled. I will. I apologize for making you angry by calling you other than by your name. Please forgive me. I've never done this before. I was only doing as I thought I should, following the rules as I was trained. Forget the rules. Just be yourself. 
and you will have less trouble in life. If that would help you believe that I'm only trying to help you, then that's what I shall do. She pointed. Here, sit on the edge of the bed. Why? Though she didn't move, he felt a gentle push. He fell back to sit on the edge of the bed. Don't. She stepped between his legs, close to him. Hush. Let me do my job. I told you before, I must let my Han come to know your Radha Han, so I will know where you are at all times. She put her hands to each side of his neck, over the collar. She closed her eyes. Her breasts were right in front of his face, moving with each breath. He felt a soft, tingling sensation that sank all the way to his toes and then came back up through him. It was slightly uncomfortable, but not unpleasant, and in fact, the longer it went on, the better it felt. When she took her hands away, the absence of the sensation was agony for a moment. The world seemed to hum and spin. He shook his head. What did you do? I simply let my Han come to know your Radha Han. She looked a little dazed. She swallowed as a tear ran down her cheek. And something of your Han, your essence. She turned away. Richard stood. Does that mean that you will always know where I am now, by my collar? She nodded weakly as she strode slowly across the room. Her voice regained its control. What are your preferences for food, your special requirements? I don't eat meat. She stopped in her tracks. That's one I've never heard before. And I guess I don't like cheese anymore either. She considered a moment and then walked on. I will tell the cooks your special requirements. A plan was forming in his head, and she wasn't part of it. He needed to get rid of her. Pasha went to a tall, pickled pine wardrobe. It was filled with fine clothes. There were trousers of a smooth weave, at least a dozen shirts, mostly white, some with ruffles and coats of every color. These are yours, she said. If everyone was surprised I was grown, why are they a size of a grown man? She inspected the various items, feeling the fabric, taking some out and holding them up for a better look. Someone must have known. Verna must have told them. Sister Verna. She put a black coat back. I'm sorry, Richard, but it is just Verna now. She pulled out a white shirt. Do you like this? No. I would look foolish wearing fancy things like that. She smiled coquettishly. I think you would look very handsome in it. But if it doesn't please you, there are coins on the table over there. I'll show you some shops in the city, and you may purchase whatever you like better. Richard glanced to the marble top table. There was a silver bowl of silver coins, and next to it, a gold bowl heaped full with gold coins. If he worked his whole life as a guide, he would never earn even half that much gold. It's not mine. Of course it is. You're a guest of the palace, and the palace provides whatever our guests require. If you use that up, it will be replaced. She pulled out a red coat with gold brocade on the shoulders and cuffs. Her eyes brightened. Richard, this would look simply grand on you. Even if you cover a collar with precious gems, it's still a collar. This has nothing to do with your Radha Han. What you're wearing is disgusting. You look like some savage from the woods. She held the red coat open. Here, try this on. He snatched the coat from her hands and threw it on the bed. Gripping her by the arm, he marched her to the door in the front room. Richard, stop it. What are you doing? He pulled the door open. I'm tired. It's been a long day. Good night, Pasha. Richard, I'm only trying to help you look better. You look uncivilized in that outfit. You look like some huge beast. He went calm as he took in her blue dress, blue the color of Kalin's wedding dress. That color does not become you, he said. Does not become you at all. She stood in the hall staring at him with big brown eyes. He kicked the door shut. He waited a few minutes and then checked the hall. There was no sign of her. He went to his pack beside the fireplace and started taking things out. He wouldn't need everything. No need carrying all his extra clothes. As he was stretching the string to the bow, there was a soft rap at the door. He crept across the carpets, listening. Maybe she would go away if he didn't answer it. He didn't need her hanging around, telling him what to wear. He had important things to do. The soft knock came again. Maybe it wasn't Pasha. Richard pulled his knife. He yanked the door open. Sister Verna. I just saw Pasha running down the hall in tears. I'm surprised at you, Richard. She lifted an eyebrow to him. I didn't think it would take you that long. I've been hiding around a corner, afraid I would be caught while I waited. A shawl capped her curly hair and spread down over her shoulders. Did you have to make her cry? She is fortunate I didn't make her bleed. She lifted the shawl from her head and settled it around her shoulders. A small smile touched her lips. May I come in? He held out his arm in invitation. And it is simply Verna, she said, as she stepped through the threshold. I am not a sister. 
He slipped the knife back into its sheath. I'm sorry, but I don't think I could bring myself to call you anything else. To me, you are Sister Verna. It is not proper to address me as Sister. She looked around the room as he closed the door. How are the accommodations? They would not embarrass a king. Sister Verna, I know you won't believe me, but I'm really sorry about what happened. I didn't mean to bring my troubles down on you. A broad grin spread on her face. You have been a constant trouble to me, Richard. But for once, this trouble was not caused by you. Another brought this trouble upon me. Sister, I know I caused you to be broken to a novice. I didn't intend that. But the part about you being sent to work in the stables, that was your own doing. Things are not always as they seem, Richard. There was a twinkle in her eye. I hate scrubbing pots. When I was a novice, when I was young, I hated that more than anything else. I'm not happy in a kitchen, and less so with my hands in scalding water. I like horses much better. They don't talk back or argue with me. I like being around horses, more so since you destroyed the bits and I became friends with Jessup. Sister Marin thought she held the reins, as it were, but she was doing what I wished. Richard smiled with one side of his mouth. You are a very devious woman, Sister Verna. I'm proud of you. But I'm still sorry you are put back to novice because of me. She shrugged. I'm here to serve the Creator. It matters not how. And this is not your doing. The prelate's orders are what caused me to be broken to a novice. You mean the order she wrote in the book? She forbade you from using your power on me, didn't she? How do you know that? I figured it out. You were often angry enough to spit fire at me, but you never used your power to stop me. I don't think that would have happened unless you were under orders to watch, but not to interfere. After all, if the Radha Han is used to control, why else would you not use that control? She shook her head to herself. You are a very devious person yourself, Richard. How long have you known? since I read the book in the tower. Why are you here, sister? I wanted to see if you were all right. Starting tomorrow, I won't get the chance again. At least not for a very long time. Not until I'm raised to Sister of the Light again. First-rank novices aren't allowed to have anything to do with young wizards. The penalty is quite severe. Your first day as a novice, and already you're breaking the rules. You shouldn't be here. You'll be up to your elbows in scalding water and dirty pots if they catch you. She shrugged. Some things are more important than rules. Richard frowned at the distant look in her eyes. Why don't you sit? I don't have time. I only came to keep a promise. She pulled something from a pocket. And to bring you this. She lifted his hand and placed something in it, then closed his fingers around it. When Richard opened his fingers and looked, his knees almost buckled. It was the lock of Kaylin's hair he had thrown away. Sister Verna clasped her hands together. The first night... The first night we were together, I found that. Without looking up, he whispered, What do you mean you found it? She leaned back and looked up at the ceiling. After you fell asleep, after you decided not to kill me, I went for a walk and found it. His eyes slid closed. I can't take this, he managed to make himself say. I have set her free. Kalen made a great sacrifice to save your life. I promised her that I would not let you forget that she loves you. Richard's strength had vanished. The muscles in his legs quivered, his hand shook. I can't take this. She sent me away. I have set her free. Sister Verna spoke softly. She loves you, Richard. Please, as a favor to me, take it. I have violated the rules to bring this to you. I made a promise to Kaylin to make sure you know she loves you. I was reminded again today what a rare thing real love is. Richard felt as if the whole weight of the palace had fallen down on him. All right, sister, as a favor to you. But I know she doesn't want me. If you love someone, you don't ask them to put a collar around their neck. You don't send them away. She wishes to be free. I love her, and so I have set her free. Someday, Richard, I hope you will realize how much she has sacrificed and the truth of her love. Love is a precious thing and should not be forgotten. I don't know what your life holds in store, but someday you will find love again. But I think you need a friend more than anything else right now. I'm sincere in my offer, Richard. Will you take this collar off me? She was silent a moment. Her voice came heavy with regret. I cannot, Richard. It would bring you to harm. I have a duty to preserve your life. The collar must stay on. He nodded. I have no friends. I am in enemy territory and enemy hands. That's not true. But I'm afraid that as a novice, I won't have the chance to convince you otherwise. Pasha looks like a nice young woman. 
Try to make friends with her, Richard. You need a friend. I can't make friends with someone I may have to kill. I meant every word I said today, sister. I know, Richard, she whispered. I know. But Pasha is almost your age. Sometimes it's easier to make friends with those your own age. I think she would like to be your friend. For a novice, this is as important a time as it is for a young wizard. The relationship between a novice and the wizard she is assigned is unique. The bond that will grow is very special and will last the lifetime of each. She too is frightened. Her whole life she has been a student, a novice. Now for the first time, she is the teacher. Not only the boy learns, but the girl too. They both are entering a new life. It is a very special thing for both. Slave and master, that is the only bond. She sighed. I doubt any novice has ever faced a task like the one Pasha will have. Try to be understanding of her, Richard. Pasha is going to have her hands full with you. The Creator knows the prelate herself would have her hands full with you. Richard stared off at nothing. Have you ever killed anyone you loved, sister? Well, no. Richard lifted the Aegeal in his fist. Denna held me by my magic, as do the sisters. She kept a collar around my neck, as do the sisters. They had tortured her until she was mad enough to do the same to me. I understood how she could do it because I would have done anything she said to keep from being hurt anymore. He was hardly aware of the pain from the Aegeal ripping through him. I understood her and I loved her. A tear ran down his face. That was the only way I was able to escape. She controlled the rage of the sword. Because I was able to love her, I was able to turn the blade of the Sword of Truth white. Dear Creator, Sister Verna whispered, her eyes wide. You have turned the sword's blade white? Richard closed his eyes and nodded. I had to take the love of her into my heart. Only then could I turn the blade white. Only then could I run it through her while she looked lovingly into my eyes. Only because I loved her could I kill her and escape. As long as I live, I will never be able to forgive myself. Sister Verna embraced him protectively. Dear Creator, she whispered. What have you done to your child? Richard pushed her away. Go, sister, before you get into trouble. He wiped his eyes. I'm being foolish. She gripped his shoulders. Why didn't you tell me this before? He wiped his sleeve across his nose. It's not something I'm proud of. And you are the enemy, sister. He looked to her wet eyes. I've told you the truth. I told the other sisters the truth today. I will kill anyone I must. Sister, I'm capable of killing anyone. I'm the bringer of death. I'm a monster. That's why Kalin wanted me sent away. She brushed his hair back from his face. She loves you, Richard. She was trying to save your life. Someday you will see that. She sighed. I'm sorry, I must go. Will you be all right? His smile was empty. I don't think so, sister. I think there is going to be war. I think I'm going to end up killing sisters. I hope you aren't one of them. She wiped her fingers across his cheek. We never know what the Creator has in store for us. If this Creator of yours has any power, I think you'll be restored to Sister a lot sooner than you think, Sister. I must go. Good luck to you, Richard. Have faith. As soon as she was gone, he threw his cloak around his shoulders and put on his pack. He had to act now while they were still afraid of him, while they were still unsure. He checked that the sword was clear in its scabbard. He hooked the quiver on his back and shouldered his bow as he moved out onto the balcony. With a running knot, Richard attached the rope to the stone railing. He put his knife between his teeth and then slipped over the edge into the darkness, into his element. Chapter 51 Night didn't seem to diminish the number of people on the streets of Tanamura. The little fires cooking meat on sticks still burned, and the hawkers still conducted a brisk business. Men called to him to throw dice with them. Once they saw his collar, people tried to entice him into buying everything from food to shell necklaces for his lady. He told them that he had no coins. They laughed, saying that the palace would pay for anything he wanted. Richard hunched his shoulders and kept walking. Women dressed in flimsy, revealing clothes pressed against him, giggling and smiling as they ran their hands over him, trying to get fingers into his pockets. They made him offers he could hardly believe. Pushing didn't get them away. His glare did. Richard was relieved to leave the city behind, to leave the lights of torches, lamps, candles, and fires behind, to leave behind the smells and the noise. He breathed easier when he was into the moonlit country. He glanced over his shoulder at the twinkling lights while he climbed the hills. 
He was constantly aware of the collar around his neck and wondered what would happen if he went too far, though from what Pasha had told him, that was many more miles than he intended to go. Still, he worried she might be wrong and that the slack in his chain might suddenly snap tight. Finally, he reached a satisfactory spot. He surveyed the grassy prominence overlooking the city in the distance. A little way off to the side, in the swale, he could see the dark shapes of old trees looming up in the moonlight, shadows black as death lurked in the gaps. Richard stared at the menacing gloom for a time, transfixed by a faint lingering desire to go into the waiting folds of its night. Something in him hungered to go in there and call forth the magic. Something in him lusted to bring forth the rage, to let it vent its wrath, vent his wrath. It felt as if his frustration at being held against his will, his anger at being a helpless prisoner, his fear at not knowing what was going to happen to him and his heartache for Kalin all needed to be let out like pounding a fist against a wall when you were angry. Somehow, those woods promised him that release. Richard finally turned from the Hagen woods and set about collecting firewood. With his knife, he whittled the pile of shavings into a bare spot he had scooped out with his boot. Striking steel and flint, he started the shavings to smoldering, and once they had taken with a good flame, he piled on some wood. Once the fire was going nicely, he set out a pot, poured in water, and started cooking rice and beans. While he waited for it to cook, he finished a small piece of bannock he still had left. He sat, his arms curled around his knees, and watched the dark woods, the Hagen woods. He watched the city shimmering in the distance. The sky overhead was a sparkling canopy of stars. He watched the sky, too, waiting to see a familiar shape blacken the patch of stars. After a time, he heard a soft thud behind him. He laughed when the furry arms grabbed him and tumbled him onto the ground. Gratch gurgled with his throaty laugh, his arms and legs and wings trying to enwrap his opponent. Richard tickled his ribs, and Gratch roared with a deep, growling laughter. The tussle ended with Gratch finally on top, hugging Richard with arms and wings. Richard embraced the little gar tightly. Gratch, lug, Gratch, arg. Richard squeezed him tighter. I love you too, Gratch. Gratch put his wrinkly nose to Richard's. His glowing green eyes looked down, and he let out in a throaty giggle. Richard wrinkled his nose. Gratch, your breath smells. He sat up, holding the gar in his lap. Did you catch some food on your own? Gratch nodded enthusiastically. Richard hugged him again. I'm so proud of you. And you did it without blood flies. What did you get? Gratch cocked his head to the side. His furry ears turned forward. Did you get a turtle? Richard asked. Gratch giggled and shook his head. Did you get a deer? Gratch sagged with a regretful growl. Did you get a rabbit? Gratch bounced and shook his head, enjoying the game. I give up. What did you have to eat? Gratch covered his eyes with his claws, peeking out between them. A raccoon? You got a raccoon? Gratch nodded with a toothy grin, then threw his head back and roared as he pounded his chest. Richard patted the beast's back. Good for you. Very good. Gratch gave a gurgling giggle and then tried to push Richard back for more wrestling. Richard was relieved that the gar was finally able to start catching his own food. He made Gratch sit still and settle down while he checked the rice and beans. He held the pot out. You want some of my dinner with me? Gratch leaned close and carefully smelled the pot. He knew it was hot. He had gotten a burn before and was careful now when Richard cooked things. He wrinkled his nose at the rice and beans. He made a croaking sound and rolled his shoulders. Richard knew that meant he wasn't enthusiastic, but if nothing better was forthcoming, he would have some. Richard poured him some in his own bowl. Blow on it, it's hot. Gratch held the tin bowl to his face and pursed his leathery lips. He blew air and spit between his fangs as he tried to cool his snack. Richard ate with a spoon as he watched the gar trying to lick the rice and beans from the bowl. Finally, Gratch rolled onto his back and holding the bowl with his claws and feet, poured its contents in his mouth. In three swallows, it was gone. Gratch sat up and flapped his wings. He scooted close. With a plaintive babble, he held out his bowl to Richard. Richard showed him the empty pot. All gone, Gratch's ears wilted. He put a hooked claw to Richard's bowl and gave it a little tug. Richard pulled his bowl away and turned his back. Mine. It's my dinner. Gratch resigned himself to waiting patiently while Richard finished eating. When Richard pulled his knees up and wrapped his arms around them as he watched the city, Gratch squatted and tried to imitate the pose. Richard pulled the lock of hair from his pocket. He twirled it in the moonlight, staring while he watched it turning. 
Gratch thrust out a claw. Richard elbowed it away. No, he said in a low voice. You can touch, but only if you're gentle. Gratch reached out tentatively, slowly, carefully touching a claw to the lock of hair. His glowing green eyes looked up, studying. He stroked the claw down Richard's hair. Gratch touched Richard's cheek, touched a tear rolling down. Richard sniffed and swallowed. He put the lock of hair back in his pocket. Gratch put a gangly arm around Richard's shoulder and laid his head against him. Richard put his arm around Gratch, and they watched the night for a time. Finally deciding he had better get some sleep, Richard found a spot of thick grass on which to spread a blanket. He lay down with Gratch curled up close, and the two of them fell asleep together. Richard woke when the moon was nearly down. He sat up and stretched. Gratch made fists and imitated Richard, adding wings to the yawning stretch. Richard rubbed his eyes. It would be dawn in an hour or two. It was time. He stood, Gratch coming up beside him. I want you to listen to me, Gratch. I have some important things to tell you. Are you listening? Gratch nodded, his wrinkly face set in a serious cast. Richard pointed to the city. You see that place with all the fire, all the light? I'm going to live there for a while. Richard tapped his chest and then pointed to the city. I'm going to be down there, but I don't want you to visit me there. You must stay away. It's a dangerous place for you. You stay away. Gratch watched Richard's face. I'll come up here to visit you, all right? Gratch thought a moment and then nodded. You stay away from the city. And you see the river down there? You know what a river is. I've shown you water. You stay on this side of the water, this side, understand? Richard didn't want the gar hunting the livestock on the farms on the other side of the river. That would surely get him in trouble. Gratch looked from Richard's face to the city and then back. He made a sound from deep in his throat to express his understanding. And Gratch, if you see any people, Richard tapped his chest and pointed to the city. People like me, don't you eat them? He put a finger in front of Gratch's face. People are not food. Don't eat any people, understand? Gratch growled in disappointment and then nodded. Richard put an arm around the gar's shoulders and turned him toward the Hagen Woods. Now listen, this is important. You see that place down there, those woods? A low, menacing growl rose from the gar's throat. His lips drew back from his fangs. The glow in his green eyes intensified. You stay out of there. I don't want you going into that place. I mean it, Gratch. You stay away. Gratch watched the woods, the growl still in his throat. Richard gripped a fistful of fur and gave him a shake. You stay away from there, understand? Gratch glanced over and finally nodded. I have to go in there, but you can't follow. It's dangerous in there for you. Stay out. With a plaintive pewl, Gratch put an arm around Richard and pulled him back a step. I'll be safe. I have the sword. Remember the sword? I showed you my sword. It will protect me, but you can't come with me. Richard hoped he was right about the sword. Sister Verna had told him that the Hagen Woods were a place of vile magic, but he had no choice. It was the only plan he could think of. Richard gave the gar a tight hug. You be a good boy. Go hunt yourself some more food. I'll be coming up here to see you and we'll wrestle, all right? Gratch grinned at the mention of wrestling. He pulled hopefully on Richard's arm. Not now, Gratch. I have something I must do, but I'll come back on another night and wrestle with you. Gratch's ears wilted again. His long arms wrapped around Richard in a goodbye hug. Richard collected his things and, with a final wave, headed down into the swale. Gratch watched as the dark woods swallowed him up. Richard walked for close to an hour. He needed to be deep enough into the Hagen Woods to make sure his plan would work. Limbs draped with moss and vines looked like arms reaching out to snatch him. Sounds drifted through the trees, guttural clicking and long, low whistles. Off in stagnant stretches of water, things splashed at his approach. Warm and breathing hard with the effort of the walk, he came to a small clearing, high enough to be dry and open enough to afford him the view of a small patch of stars. There was no rock or log in the clearing, so he flattened a thick clump of grass and sat down beside his pack, crossing his legs. He closed his eyes and drew a deep breath. Richard thought about home and the heartland woods. He longed to be back in his woods, he thought about the friends he missed so much, Chase and Zed. All the time he had grown up with the old man, Richard had never known Zed was his grandfather, but he had known he was his friend and that they loved each other. He guessed that was what mattered. 
what difference would it have made anyway? Richard could not have loved him more, and Zed could not have been more of a friend. It had been so long since he had seen Zed. Although he had seen him at the People's Palace in Dahara, he hadn't really had much time to talk with him, to catch up on things. He shouldn't have left so soon. He wished he could talk to Zed now, to seek his help and understanding. Richard had no idea if Kaylin would go to Zed. Why should she? She was rid of Richard, and that was what she wanted. He wished with all his heart it weren't so. He missed her smile, her green eyes, the soft sound of her voice, her intelligence and wit, her touch. She made the world alive for him. He would have given his life at that moment just to hold her for five minutes. But she knew what he was, and had sent him away, and he had set her free. It was for the best. He wasn't good enough for her. Before he realized what he was doing, he was seeking the peace within himself, seeking his Han, as Sister Verna had taught him. He had practiced almost every day when he had been with her, and although he never felt his Han, whatever it was, it had always felt pleasant to seek it. It was relaxing and brought peace. It felt good to do that now. He let his mind find that place of peace and let his worries drift away. In his mind, as he always did, he pictured the sword of truth floating in space before his mind's eye. He saw every detail of it, felt every detail of it. In his peace, in his meditation, without opening his eyes, Richard drew his sword. He wasn't quite sure why, except it felt the right thing to do. The unique ring of steel hung in the night air announcing the blade's arrival to the Hagen Woods. He laid the sword across his knees. The magic danced with him in the place of peace. If anything came, he would be ready. Now he had to wait. It would be quite a while, he was sure. But she would come. When she realized where he was, she would come. As he sat still and quiet, the night returned to its normal activity around him. While he concentrated on the picture of the sword, Richard was vaguely aware of the chirps and clicks of bugs, the low, steady croaks of frogs, and the rustling of mice and voles among the dry debris of the forest floor. The air occasionally whirred with a bat. Once he heard a squeak as an owl caught its dinner. And then, while in the dreamlike haze as he sat and pictured the sword, the night became still. In his mind, he saw the dark shape behind him. In one fluid movement, Richard was up and spinning, the sword tip whistling through the air. The flowing shape pitched back and lunged again when the sword was passed. Richard felt a thrill that he had missed, that it would not be ended so soon, that he could dance with the spirits, that he could let the rage free. It moved like a cape in the wind, dark as death and just as quick. Around the clearing they darted, the sword glinting in the waning light of the moon, the blade slicing the air, the dark shape's blade-like claws flashing past. Richard immersed himself in the sword's magic, in its wrath, in his own. He freed his anger and frustration to join with the sword's own fury, reveling in the dance with death. Across the clearing they spun like leaves in a gale, one avoiding the blade, the other the claws. Lunging and ducking, they used the trees for cover and attack. Richard let the spirits of the sword dance with him. He immersed himself in the magic's mastery. He let himself do as the spirits counseled, and he watched, almost in a detached state, as they spun him this way and that, had him skim across the ground, dodge right, then left, leap and thrust. He hungered to learn the dance. Teach me. Knowledge like memory flowed forth, forged by his will into the completing link. He became not the user of the sword, the magic, the spirits, but their master. The blade, the magic, the spirits, and the man were one. The dark shape lunged. Now, with a solid thwack, the blade halved the shape. A spray of blood hit the trees close by. A death howl shivered the air, and then all was still. Richard stood panting, almost sorry it was over. Almost. He had danced with the spirits of the dead, with the magic, and in so doing had found the release he sought. Release not only of some of his feelings of helpless frustration, but release, too, of darker needs deep within himself that he didn't understand. The sun had been up for nearly two hours when he heard her coming. She was blundering through the brush, huffing indignantly at branches that snagged her clothes. He could hear twigs snap as she staggered up the rise. Tugging her skirt free from a thorn, she stumbled into the clearing before him. Richard was sitting cross-legged, with his eyes closed and the sword resting across his knees. She came to a panting halt before him. Richard! Good morning, Pasha, 
He opened his eyes. Beautiful day, isn't it? She held her long brown skirt up a little in her hands. Her white blouse was damp with sweat. Her hair had burrs in it. Pasha blew a strand of hair from her face. You have to get out of here at once, Richard. This is the Hoggin Woods. I know. Sister Verna told me. Interesting place. I rather like it. She blinked at him. Richard, this place is dangerous. What are you doing here? Richard smiled to her. Waiting for you? She peered around at trees and dark shadows. Something smells awful in here, she muttered. Pasha squatted down in front of him, smiling a little smile as a person might to a child or to someone she thought was insane. Richard, you've had your fun, your nice walk in the country. Now give me your hand and let's get out of here. I'm not leaving until Verna is restored to sister again. Pasha shot to her feet. What? Richard took his sword in hand and rose in front of her. I'm not leaving here until Verna is restored to the rank of sister, the same as she was before. The palace must choose what's more important to them, my life or keeping sister Verna a novice. Pasha's mouth fell open. But the only one who could remove Verna's sanction is sister Marin. I know. He touched his finger to her nose. That's why you're going to go and tell Sister Marin she must come here in person and give me her solemn pledge that Verna is once again a sister and agree to my terms. You can't be serious. Sister Marin will not do that. I'm not leaving this spot unless she does. Richard, we'll go back and see if Sister Marin will discuss this, but you can't stay here. It's not worth dying for. He regarded her with a cool expression. It is to me. Her tongue wet her lips. Richard, you don't know what you're doing. This is a dangerous place. I'm responsible for you. I can't allow you to stay here. If you won't come away with me, then I will have to use the collar and make you come with me. And I know you don't want that. Richard's grip tightened on the sword's hilt. Sister Verna is being punished in retaliation against me. I have made a vow to myself to restore Verna to sister. I can't allow the sanction to stand. I'll do whatever I must. Die here if I have to. If you use the collar to hurt me or drag me off, I'll fight you with everything I have. I don't know who will win, but if that happens, I am sure of one thing. One of us will die. If it's you, then the war will have started. If I die, then your test to become a sister will end on the first day. Sister Verna will still be a novice, but that is where she stands now. At least I will have done my best. You would be willing to die for this? Yes. It's that important to me. I will not allow Sister Verna to be punished because of what I have done. It was unjust. Her brow wrinkled. But Sister Marin is the headmistress of the novices. I'm a novice. I can't go to her and tell her she must reverse the order. She'll skin me alive. I am the cause of the trouble. You are simply the messenger. If she punishes you, I would not stand for it any more than I will stand for what was done to Sister Verna. If Sister Marin wishes to start a war, then let it start. If she wishes to keep my truce, then she will have to come to me here and agree to my terms. Pasha stared at him. Richard, if you are here when the sun goes down, you will die. Then I would suggest you hurry. She turned, holding her arm out toward the city. But I must go all the way back. It took me hours to get here. It will take me hours to go back. And then I must find Sister Marin, and then convince her that you're serious. And even if I could get her to agree to return with me, we must still get back here. You should have ridden a horse. But I ran here as soon as I realized where you were. I wasn't thinking about a horse or anything else. I knew there was trouble and just came after you. He gave her an even look. Then you made a mistake, Pasha. You should have thought before you acted. Next time, maybe you will think first. Pasha put a hand to her chest as she gulped air. Richard, there is hardly time. Then you had better hurry, or your new charge will be sitting here in Hoggen Woods when the sun goes down. Her eyes moistened with frustration and concern. Richard, please, you don't understand. This is no game. This place is dangerous. He turned a little and pointed with the sword. Yes, I know. Pasha peered around him to the shadows and gasped. Hesitantly, she stepped to the thing by the trees. Richard didn't follow. He knew what was there, two halves of a creature from a nightmare, its guts spilled across the ground. Its sinuous head, like a man's half-melted into a snake or lizard, was a picture of wickedness itself covered in a glossy, tight black skin, smoothed down to the base of the thick neck where it began welting up into pliable scales. The lithe body was shaped much like a man's. The whole of the creature seemed made for fluid speed, deadly quick grace. It wore hides covered with short black hair and a full-length black hooded cape. What Richard had taken for claws were not claws, 
but three bladed knives, one in each webbed hand, with crosswise handles held in the fist. Steel extensions went up each side of the wrist for support when a strike was made. Pasha stood dumbstruck. Richard finally went to stand by her, looking down at the two halves of the thing. Whatever it was, it bled, the same as any other creature, and it smelled like fish guts rotting in the hot sun. Pasha stood trembling as she stared at the thing. Dear creator, she whispered, it's a mriswith. She took a step back. What happened to it? What happened to it? I killed it. That's what happened to it. What sort of thing is a mriswith? Her big brown eyes came to his. What do you mean you killed it? You can't kill a mriswith. No one has ever killed a mriswith. Her face was a picture of consternation. Well, someone has killed one now. You killed it at night, didn't you? Yes, Richard frowned. How do you know that? Mriswith are rarely seen outside Hog and Woods, but there have been reports over the last few thousand years. Reports given by people who somehow managed to live long enough to tell what they saw. The Mriswith always take on the color of what is around them. In one report, one rose up in the tidal flats and was the color of mud. One time in the sand dunes, it was the color of the sand. One report noted that in the light of a golden sunset, the Mriswith was golden. When they kill at night, they're never seen because they are black like the night. We think they have the ability, maybe the magic, to assume the color of their surroundings. Since this one is black, I guessed that you killed it at night. Richard took her arm, gently pulling her away. She seemed transfixed by the creature. He could feel her trembling under his hand. Pasha, what are they? Things that live in the Hagen Woods. I don't know what they are. I've heard it said that in the war that separated the New World from the Old, the wizards created armies of the Mriswith. Some people believe the Mriswith are sent by the Nameless One, but the Hagen Woods are their home, and the home of other things. They are why no one lives out in the country, on this side of the river. Sometimes they come out of the woods and hunt people. They never devour their kills. They seem simply to kill for the sake of killing. Mriswith disembowel their victims. Some live long enough to tell what got them. That is how we know as much as we know. How long have the Hagen Woods, the creatures, been here? As far as I know, at least as long as the Palace of the Prophets, nearly 3,000 years. She took a fistful of his shirt. In all that time, no one, not once, has ever killed a Mriswith. Every victim said that they never saw it until after it slashed them open. Some of those victims have been sisters and wizards, and not even their Han warned them. They said they were blind to its coming, as if they were born without the gift. How is it you were able to kill a Mriswith? Richard remembered seeing it coming in his mind. He took her hand from his shirt. Maybe I was just lucky. Someone was bound to get one sooner or later. Maybe this one was just a half-wit. Richard, please, come away with me. This is not the way to have a test of wills with the palace. This could get you killed. I'm not testing anyone's will. I'm taking responsibility for my actions. It's my fault Sister Verna was demoted. I've got to set it straight. I'm taking a stand for what's right. If I don't do that, then I am nothing. Richard, if the sun sets on you in the Hagen Woods, you are wasting precious time, Pasha. Chapter 52 It was late afternoon when he heard them coming. He heard the sound of only one horse and Pasha's voice calling out the direction. At last, they broke into the clearing. Richard sheathed his sword. Bonnie! He gave the horse's neck a scratch. How you doing, girl? Bonnie nuzzled his chest. Richard pushed his fingers in the side of her mouth and felt the bit while Sister Marin frowned at him. I'm glad to see you use a snapple bit, Sister. The staple boys said they couldn't find the spade bits. She stared down at him suspiciously. Seems they vanished, mysteriously. That's so, Richard shrugged. Can't say I'm sorry. Pasha was panting with the effort of having kept up with the sister on her horse. Her white blouse was soaked with sweat. She fussed hopelessly with the matted, tangled mess of her hair. The sister must have made Pasha walk as punishment. Sister Marin, in her plain brown dress, buttoned to her neck, looked cool and comfortable atop the horse. So, Richard, Sister Marin said as she dismounted, I am here as you requested. What is it you want? She knew very well what he wanted, but Richard decided to restate it in a pleasant tone. It's quite simple. Sister Verna is to be restored to sister at once and you are also to return her dacra to her. She gestured dismissively. And here I thought you would want something unreasonable. This is simple. It is done. Verna is returned to sister. It makes no difference to me. 
And when she asks why, I don't want you to tell her about this business with me. Just say you reconsidered or something and decided to reinstate her. If you want, you can tell her you prayed for guidance from your creator and it came to you that she should remain a sister. She brushed some of her fine sandy hair back from her face. That would suit me. Are you satisfied? Is everything to your liking? That would end it and keep our truce. Good. Now that the trifling matters are dispensed with, show me this dead bear. Pasha has half the palace in an uproar with some babble about you killing a Mriswith. Pasha furiously studied the ground as Sister Marin directed a scolding frown in her direction. The foolish child never sets her slippered foot on anything that hasn't been swept, scrubbed, or polished. The only time she sticks her head out of doors is go see the latest bolt of lace to come to Tanamura. She wouldn't know a rabbit from an ox, and she certainly wouldn't know a... What is that smell? Bear guts, Richard said. He held out his arm, showing her the way. Pasha deferentially stepped aside. Sister Marin straightened her dress at her hips and marched toward the trees. Pasha peeked up at him, and when they heard Sister Marin gasp, her head came the rest of the way up, and she smiled. When Sister Marin stepped backward to them, her face white as bedsheets, Pasha resumed her study of the ground. Sister Marin's trembling fingers lifted Pasha's chin. You have spoken the truth, she whispered. Forgive me, child. Pasha curtsied. Of course, Sister Marin. Thank you for taking the time to witness my report. Sister Marin's haughty attitude had vanished to be replaced by sincere concern. She turned to Richard. How did this creature die? Richard lifted the sword clear of its scabbard a half foot and then slid it home. Then what Pasha said is true? You killed it? Richard shrugged. I spend quite a lot of my time out of doors. I knew it was no rabbit. Sister Marin returned to the creature, mumbling to herself. I must study it. This is an unprecedented opportunity. Pasha looked to Richard and wrinkled her nose in disgust as the sister ran her fingers over the lipless slit of a mouth, touched the ear holes, and ran her hand across the glossy black skin. She tugged at the hide clothes, pulling them this way and that as she inspected them. She rose to her feet, peering down at the entrails. Finally, she turned to Richard. Where is the cape? Pasha said it had a cape. When the Mriswith had lunged, and he had sliced it in two, the cape had been billowed open, and so it was undamaged. While Richard had been waiting for Pasha to return with the sister, he had accidentally learned the astonishing thing the cape could do. After that, he had washed it clean of blood, hung it over branches to dry, and then stuffed it away in his pack. He had no intention of giving that cape away. It's mine. It is a prize of battle. I'm keeping it. She looked perplexed. But the knives... Don't men fancy things like that as prizes of battle? Why would you want a cape instead of the knives? Richard tapped the hilt. I have my sword. Why would I want knives that have proven inferior to my sword? I've always wanted a long black cape, and it's a fine one, so I'm keeping it. The furrows of her scowl stole back onto her face. Is this another condition of your truce? If need be. The furrows softened. She sighed. I guess it doesn't matter. It is the creature that is important, not its cape. She turned back to the reeking corpse. I must study this. While she bent back to the Mriswith, Richard hooked his bow, quiver of arrows, and pack to the front of the saddle. He put his foot in a stirrup and sprang onto Bonnie. Don't stay after the sun goes down, Sister Marin. She glanced over her shoulder. My horse! You can't have my horse! Richard smiled apologetically. I twisted my ankle fighting the Mriswith. I'm sure you wouldn't want the palace's newest pupil limping all the way home, now would you? I might fall and crack my skull. But... Richard reached down and gripped Pasha's arm. She gasped in surprise as he yanked her up, sitting her behind him on Bonnie. Please don't let the sun set on you here, sister. I hear it's dangerous in the Hagen Woods after dark. Pasha hid her face from the sister, and he could feel her giggling softly against his back. Yes, yes, Sister Marin said, her eyes already lost to the Mriswith. All right, you two go on back. You have done well, both of you. I must study this creature before the animals get to it. Pasha held him so tight that he could hardly breathe. It was distracting to feel her firm breasts mashed against his back. Her fingers gripped his chest, trying to get a better hold on him, as if she was afraid she might fall at any moment. When they were clear of the woods and into the open hills, he slowed Bonnie to a walk and pried Pasha's hands off. She clamped them right back. Richard, I might fall! He pulled her hands loose again. You're not going to fall. Just hold on easy and let your hips move with the horse. Use your balance. You don't need to cling for dear life. She gripped his sides. Well, I'll try. The sky was turning golden as they descended the rounded hills toward the city. 
Richard swayed with Bonnie's steps as she went over rocks and across shallow ravines and thought about the Riswith and his hunger to fight it. The craving to go back into the Hagen Woods still burned in the back of his mind. Your ankle isn't really twisted, is it? Pasha asked after a long ride in silence. No. You lied to a sister. Richard, you must learn that lying is wrong. The Creator hates lies. So Sister Verna has told me. He decided he didn't want to ride anymore with her holding on to him, so he dismounted and led Bonnie by the reins. Pasha scooted forward into the saddle. Then why did you do it if you know it's wrong? Because I wanted to make Sister Marin walk back. She made you walk all the way out there again as punishment for something that was not your fault. Pasha slid off Bonnie and came up to walk beside him. She raked her fingers through her hair, trying to arrange it to her satisfaction. That was very nice of you. She put a hand on his arm. I think we're going to become friends. Richard pretended to turn and look around as he walked so that her arm fell away. Can you get this collar off me? The Radahan? Well, no. Only a full sister is able to remove a Radahan. I don't know how. Then we are not going to be friends. I have no use for you. You have gone to great risk for Sister Verna. She must be your friend. A person only does such things for friends. You went out of your way to see that I had a horse to ride back. You must hope we can become friends. Richard watched the country ahead as he walked. Sister Verna is not my friend. I did as I did only because what was done to her was my fault and was unjust. That is the only reason. When I decide to get this collar off, only those who help me will be my friends. Sister Verna has made it clear that she will not help me get the collar off. She intends that it remain on me. When the time comes, if she stands in my way, I will kill her the same as I will kill any other sister who tries to stop me, the same as I will kill you if you stand in my way. Richard, she scoffed, you're a mere student. You shouldn't brag about your powers so. It's unbecoming to a young man. You should not even joke about such things. She took his arm again. I don't believe you would ever hurt a woman. Then you believe wrong. Most young men have trouble adjusting at first, but you will come to trust in me. We will become friends, I'm sure of it. Richard yanked his arm away and spun to her. This is no game, Pasha. If you get in my way when I decide the time has come, I will cut your pretty little throat. She peered up at him with a coy smile. Do you really think I have a pretty neck? It's a figure of speech, he growled. He moved on, tugging Bonnie ahead. Pasha hastened her step to keep up. She walked in silence for a time, busying herself with pulling little knots and burrs from her hair. Richard was in no mood to be pleasant. Killing the Mriswith had brought him a strange feeling of fulfillment, but it was fading now, and his frustration with his situation was returning, and it brought with it the anger. Pasha's face brightened. She put on a pleasant smile. I don't know anything about you, Richard. Why don't you tell me about yourself? What do you want to know? Well, what did you do before you came to the palace? Did you have some kind of skill? A profession you worked at? Richard scuffed his boots through the dirt. I was a woods guide. Where? Where I grew up, in Heartland, in Westland. Pasha pulled the white blouse away from her chest, trying to dry it. I'm afraid I don't know where that is. I don't know about the new world. Someday, when I'm a sister, maybe I'll be called upon to go there and help a boy. Richard didn't say anything, so she went on. So you were a woods guide. That must have been scary, being out in the woods all the time. Weren't you afraid of the animals? I'd be afraid of the animals. Why? If a rabbit jumped out of a bush, you could just burn it to ashes with your Han. She giggled. I'd still be frightened. I like the city better. She pulled some hair back from her face and looked at him as they walked. She had a funny way of wrinkling her nose. Did you have a, well, you know, a girl, a love, or anything? Richard was taken by surprise at the question. His mouth opened, but no words came out. He snapped it closed. He was not about to discuss Kalin with her. I have a wife. Pasha missed a step. She hurried to catch back up. A wife? She considered a moment. Her voice now had an edge to it. What is her name? Richard kept his eyes straight ahead as he walked. Her name is Du Shailu. Pasha twisted a strand of hair around her finger. Is she pretty? What does she look like? Yes, she is pretty. She has thick black hair, a little longer than yours. She has attractive breasts, and the rest of her is shapely, too. From the corner of his eye, he could see Pasha's face glowing red. She picked at the end of the strand of hair. Her voice came quiet and cold, despite her trying to layer indifference over it. How long have you known her? A few days. 
Her hand fell away from her hair. What do you mean a few days? How could you only know her a few days? When Sister Verna and I went to the Magendi land a few days ago, they had her chained up. They were going to sacrifice her to the spirits, and they wanted me to do the killing. Sister Verna said I was to do as the Magendi wished, so we could pass through their land. Instead, I disobeyed Sister Verna and shot an arrow at their queen mother, pinning her arm to a pole. I told them that if they didn't let Du Shailu go and make peace with the Bakaban Mana, I would put the next arrow through the queen mother's head. They wisely agreed. She is one of the savages? She is Bakaban Mana, a wise woman. She is not a savage. And she wed you because you were her hero? Because you rescued her? No. Sister Verna and I had to go through her land to come here. When we were there, I killed her five husbands. Tasha snatched him by the arm. They are blade masters. You managed to kill five of them? Richard started walking again. No, I killed thirty of them. Pasha gasped. Her five husbands were among the thirty. Du Shailu is their spirit woman and said I was now the leader of her people. She said that since she was the spirit woman and I their leader, their Kaharan, I was now her husband. Pasha's smile crept back. Then you aren't really her husband. She was just telling you some of her savage, some of her Bakaban Mana spirit babble. Richard didn't say anything. Pasha's smile evaporated. Her scowl returned. Then how do you know what her breasts and the rest of her looks like? She looked the other way and gave a sniff. I suppose she rewarded you for your valor. I know because when they sent me in to kill her, she had a collar around her neck, and she was chained to a wall. She was held naked in that collar so that men could rape her whenever they wanted. Pasha swallowed and looked away again. She is with child now by one of those men. I guess that because the people to be sacrificed are held in a collar, the sisters never gave a thought of putting a stop to it. I don't guess the sisters care much what happens to someone in a collar. The sisters care, Pasha said in a small voice. Richard didn't argue. He walked on in silence. Pasha looked cold as she folded her arms beneath her breasts. The sky was turning a deep purple, but it was not getting cold. It was still warm. After a time, Pasha's step regained a bit of its bounce. She glanced over, the smile back. So, what about you? You have the gift? Did your father have the gift, too? Is that where it was passed down from? Richard's mood sank like a rock in a well. Yes, my father had the gift. She looked up hopefully. Is he still living? No, he was killed a short time ago. Pasha smoothed the front of her skirt. Oh, I'm sorry, Richard. Richard's hand tightened on the reins. I'm not. I'm the one who killed him. She froze. You killed your father? Your own father? Richard's glare locked onto her. He had me captured and put in a collar to be tortured. I killed the beautiful young woman who held the leash to that collar, and then I killed him. She had no trouble mistaking the threat in his voice, his words, or his eyes. Her lower lip began to quiver, and then Pasha burst into tears, turned and ran. Holding her skirts up in her fists, she went around an outcropping of rock and ran off over the edge of the hill. Richard let out a long sigh as he tied the reins to a slab of granite. He patted Bonnie's neck. Be a good girl. Wait here for me. He found Pasha sitting on a rock with her arms wrapped around her knees as she cried. Richard came around to face her, but she turned her face away. Her shoulders shook as she gasped in racking sobs. Go away! She put her forehead against her knees as she wailed. Or did you come to slice me to bits? Pasha, all you care about is killing people. That's not true. I want nothing more than to end the killing. Oh, sure, she cried. That's why you speak of nothing else. That's only because I've been praying for this day nearly my whole life. All I ever wanted was to be a sister of the light. The sisters help people. I wanted to be one of them. She succumbed to her tears. I'm never going to be a sister now. Sure you will. Not according to you. From what you keep telling us, you intend to kill us all. From the first moment, all you have done is threaten us. Pasha, you don't understand. Her tear-stained face came up. Don't I? We had a big banquet to make you feel welcome. Bigger even than the harvest banquet. I had to go without you and tell everyone you were ill. They all stared at me. The other novices get boys who want to learn. My friends have come to me before, complaining that their young charge brought them a frog or a bug in his pocket. You bring me a mriswith. Sister Marin said we did well today. She hardly ever says that. It's not something she does unless she really means it. You were cruel to Sister Marin. She has been headmistress of the novices ever since I came here. She is strict, but that's because she cares about us. She watches out for us. Pasha gasped back a sob. When I was little, the first day I came to the palace, I was scared. I had never been away from home. Sister Marin drew a little picture for me. 
She told me it was a picture of the Creator. She put it on my pillow and told me He would watch over me in the night so I would be safe. Pasha tried to stifle the tears but couldn't. I've always kept that picture. I wanted to give it to my boy on his first night so he wouldn't be afraid. I had it with me yesterday. When I saw you, saw that you were grown, I knew I couldn't give it to you. I didn't want to embarrass you. And when I saw you, I thought, well, Pasha, he's not a young boy like all the other novices get, but the Creator has given me the handsomest man I ever saw. I was so glad I had on my prettiest dress, the one I had been saving for that day. She gasped for air. And then you tell me I'm ugly. Richard's eyes slid closed. Pasha, I'm sorry. No, you're not, she cried. You're nothing but a big brute. We had everything prepared for you. We gave you one of the nicest rooms in the palace. You didn't care. We provided you with money for whatever you might need or want, and you act as if we insulted you. We had fine new clothes for you, and you turn your nose up at them. She wiped her tears, but more replaced them. I'd be the first to admit that there are some sisters who think too much of themselves, but most are so kind they wouldn't even step on a bug. And you hold up a bloody sword in front of them and vow to kill them. She held up fists full of her skirt and covered her face as she convulsed in sobs. Richard put a hand on her shoulder, but she pushed it away. Richard didn't know what to do with his hands. Pasha, I'm sorry. I know it must seem like... No, you're not. You're not sorry at all. You want the Radahan off. But that's what my job is, to teach you to use your gift so you can get the collar off. But you won't let me. Without the collar, you would have died. Two sisters have given their lives for you. They will never come home to their friends. Those friends wept in secret and put on a smile to welcome you. In return for trying to help you, trying to save your life, you threatened to kill us all. Richard put a gentle hand to her head. Pasha, I'm never going to be a sister. Instead of getting a boy who wants to learn, I get a madman with a sword. I'll forever be the object of laughter at the palace. Young girls will be told to behave themselves or they'll end up like Pasha Mays and be put out like she was. My dreams have come to ruin. It hurt him to see her sobbing in such pain and sorrow. Richard took her up in his arms. She fought him at first, trying to push him away. But when he pulled her against him and put her head to his shoulder, she went limp and cried all the harder. Richard held her tight and rubbed her back as she trembled and cried. He rocked her gently in his arms. I only wanted to help you, Richard, she sobbed. I only wanted to teach you. He hushed her. I know. I know. It will be all right. She shook her head against his shoulder. No, it won't. Yes, it will. You'll see. Finally, her hands came up, clutching his shirt as she cried. Richard didn't try to stop her tears. He simply held her, trying to give her comfort. Do you really think that you could teach me to use the gift and that then the sisters would take the collar off? She sniffled. That's my job. That's what I've been training for. I wanted so much to show you the beauty of the Creator, of His gift to you. That's all I wanted. Her arms circled him. She clung to him as if trying to soak up sucker. He stroked her hair. Richard, when I touched you yesterday, when I touched your Radha Han, I felt something of your Han. I felt some of your feelings. I know you hurt inside. It made me hurt just to feel a little of it. Her hand came up to the side of his neck as if to comfort him. I don't know of many things that can cause that much hurt. Richard, I'm not asking to take her place. Richard's eyes closed as his head sank down on her shoulder. He swallowed back the pain. She ran her fingers through his hair and held his head to her. After a time, he found his voice. Maybe it wouldn't hurt me to occasionally wear one of those outfits. She pushed away a little, looking up through her tears. Maybe just to the dining room with the sisters? He shrugged. That would be a good use of them, I guess. You pick one you would like me to wear. I don't know anything about fancy clothes. He managed a small smile. I'm just a woods guide. <laughs>